Hey guys, this is Garrett Wong, also known as Ensign Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager, and you're watching Astronomy Live. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hi folks, welcome to Astronomy Live. Right now we're taking a look at Betelgeuse. Or Betelgeist as some people pronounce it. So I'm just trying to double check that we're in good shape, that the CCD is not frosting up. It looks okay, I just changed the desiccant earlier today. Merry Christmas to everyone. A special Christmas present arrived in space for astronomers early this morning here by the Eastern Time Zone. That was the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. So yeah, I'm deliberately overexposing the heck out of Betelgeuse right now. Just verifying I'm not seeing any signs of CCD frosting up humidity left in the chamber. Looks okay to me. Looks okay to me. I think we're in good shape on that. Okay. Get some interesting internal reflections there from overexposing it that much. So now I'm going to calibrate the auto guider, so bear with me a minute. I'll calibrate the auto guider and the adaptive optics unit. So tonight we're going to try to chase down the James Webb Space Telescope and follow it as it travels away from Earth towards its destination, a halo orbit around the Lagrange 2 point or L2 point. Oh, why aren't you happy with me about that? I don't know. Let's make sure I take out the slack on the gears. Okay, that's good. And we calibrate, drive, and go for it. So, Merry Christmas, everyone. It's a beautiful night tonight, a little bit cool, good for the camera, and a perfect night to do some deep space astronomy. <laughs> yeah, the only amateur astronomer you know that probably has the oldest adaptive optics system ever to reach the market, the A07. Guys who use these systems have generally moved on to newer versions, but uh, I'm still rocking the original A07 because it's compatible with the ST2000, which is also uh, an older camera, but still decent, still good in my opinion. And to be to be sure, this was not cheap equipment when it came out. The combined cost of this camera and this adaptive optic system outweighs the original retail price of my telescope. Okay, so let's check the settings on the calibration. As expected, it's asymmetric about the y-axis. Well, I guess about the x-axis, technically, mathematically speaking. But anyway, we'll fix that. That looks good. And then we'll do some adaptive optics. Calibration. Calibrate AO. Hopefully, if we find a decent guide star near JWST, I haven't planned for that at all. I'm just taking a stab in the dark and hoping that uh, we find a decent guide star nearby. Okay. 
check the AO calibration. Looks like normal. Okay, so we should be... Let's see, we are currently 9.04 p.m. Eastern. That's going to be... 2... Yeah, 2.04 Universal Time. Okay. Oh. Ooh, let me make sure I've got the right... Because I know I don't. I know I don't. Yeah, I need a parent right ascension declaration. Okay, so we're now 2.05. Universal time to December 26th. Okay. I'll go ahead by a couple minutes of its current position. Alright, so I'm going to slew the telescope over to JWST now. Looks like we're still in the constellation Orion, just eyeballing it. It's not too far from Beetlejuice and Rigel and all that good stuff. Alright. Let me do something here real quick. Turn that off for a second. Okay. Turn it back on. Alright, so. One minute image on that. Ultimately, we'll go to one by one binning. Auto guider, tell me, tell me something good. Ooh, we got a star. Okay, we got a couple stars. That's good. That's what I like to see. We just <laughs> lucked out on that. Let's see if we can get away with 0.2 seconds guiding. And it looks like I can. That's decent. Okay, so we're guiding at 4 hertz. I'm just going to double check something before I get carried away. Make sure I'm going to save the images and retain them, not just discard them. Yep. We are good on that. So let's start taking pictures. We're going to do one minute exposures to start with and see how that looks. Hopefully we're above the trees. <laughs> we're close to the tree line, but it should be just above the trees. I've tried to plan it a little bit on that basis. And yeah, Kaiser Cube, exactly. Isn't that cool? JWST, because it's going to be at L2. So for those who don't know, the Lagrange Point 2 is on a line passing through the Sun and Earth. And it extends out behind Earth by about a million miles, or about 1.5 million kilometers, roughly. And so because of that, and because JWST is going to be orbiting that point, it will always be directly behind Earth, more or less. It'll always be on the night side of Earth, and should be visible from around the world, pretty much. So it will provide a sort of constant target 
um, to telescopes around the world where you'll be able to watch it and use it, say, to measure its distance with a couple of telescopes taking pictures of it simultaneously. Hint, hint, we might do that tonight. Just for the heck of things. And I think it might already be right here in the frame. I suspect that elongated looking star, I have a guess that that is JWST, maybe JWST passing next to a background star. We'll see on the next frame. Also, I need to turn off my Christmas lights. I'm noticing some significant glare. One second. So, for half this frame, this one minute exposure, the Christmas lights were still on. But after that, it should, uh, it should get better. My office light's also on. I'm not sure if that's going to create a problem or not. If it does, no big deal. I can go turn it off. Probably should anyway. Hey, it's JWST. And interesting... Hmm, that... Notice how it was... Um, it wasn't perfectly even in thickness. It still isn't. I'd say it's thicker on the top right side than the bottom left side, which suggests to me it's varying in brightness relatively quickly. Normally we associate that with a tumbling object. Well... Hope I didn't get give anyone a heart palpitation just now. Uh, I'm hoping JWST is not tumbling, but it could be rotating or doing something. They were going to do a uh, course correction maneuver oh about an hour and a half ago, um, and maybe it's still reorienting itself. It's also got that shiny foil material all over it for the sun shield and, and the protective material on it. Um, that stuff is going to change its brightness very dependent upon the, the sun angle. And so, as it passes by, of course, it could vary in brightness as well. Now it's a little more stable, maybe. But still, I'd say, yeah, it's a couple of things to note. You know, it's moving significantly. It's fairly bright to the telescope. Now, um, when it gets to its final destination, and deploys the sun shield, according to the math I did, uh, the apparent magnitude should be on the order of about magnitude 15 or so. Definitely within the range of amateur telescopes with uh, deep space CCD cameras like this. Downright bright to a camera like this, to be honest. Um, you don't start to get to challenging objects with this telescope and this camera until you get to about magnitude 18 or so. But... Um, not necessarily visible to most small telescopes with just a regular eyepiece. Could be quite a challenging object to see. Not out of the realm of possibility, though. It's about the same sort of brightness as the central star in the Ring Nebula. So, for some reference there, if you can see the central star of the Ring Nebula, uh, there's a good chance you might be able to spot JWST with your telescope. But that does require some significant aperture to do. But that's all approximate at this point. We'll see how it actually pans out. Hopefully, everything goes okay with the deployment and we don't have any issues. So I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor. I'm going to put a box around where it is right here. You can see it moving frame to frame quite significantly. That box will disappear on the next, uh, on the next frame.
But yeah, we have it. We have live images of JWST. I noticed during the webcast of the launch, towards the end when they showed JWST separating from the rocket, they said, this is the last view humanity will have of JWST as it heads out to L2. And I, I took exception to that comment. <laughs> we have a view of it right now, live for you here on YouTube. Uh, thanks to the telescope, my telescope, watching their telescope. Granted, it's not nearly as much of a close-up. It's just a point light source stri streaking away from us, but uh, there it is nevertheless. Which dot is it, Chuck White asked? So it's the one I just put the box around. I don't know if you saw that. It's, uh, it's this elongated streak. My cursor's pointing at it. I'm not sure if that's coming through. Let me change which window's active. I don't know if that's coming through in the stream or not. Hopefully it is. At least now that I changed which, uh, which window is active. Should come through. Text ob object in OBS. It's not a bad idea. I like that idea. It's better than trying to fool around with working with my mouse cursor manually. Do, 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 do. Text object. Here we go. Okay, that's way too large. Uh, I guess I can just shrink it, right? Yeah, I can shrink it. There. Haha. <laughs> Good call, Sam. Which direction is it in the night sky? Well, right now, it's basically in the constellation Orion, roughly. I'm just eyeballing it here, but yeah, it's probably within the borders of Orion. It looks like it's uh, a little bit below Orion's belt, maybe? Yeah, it's near Rigel. Yeah, it's a good, good point of reference there, Kaiser Cube. So, now, the next question that is on my mind, can I get it at the same time, right now, with eye telescope? Using a eye telescope to control a second telescope somewhere else in the world to get simultaneous observations to measure topocentric parallax and directly measure, directly measure the distance. Ooh, well, that's not good. Hmm, so the story is New Mexico skies currently closed, which is surprising because it looks clear, but there is a cloud front there on their horizon. They might have had rain or clouds completely blocking them. And looks like California's got rain. So the answer to that is probably no. Cloudy in S Spain, it was cloudy in New Mexico and they closed the observatory and it's cloudy in California, so the observatory is closed. So mine's it for tonight. But as Kaiser Cube previously mentioned and uh, as we discussed, this is gonna continue to be a, a target, a viable target for its whole life, basically. Uh, so that means it doesn't matter so much because we can get back on it at another at another time. We can get back on it a later night and uh, do simultaneous observations. So we'll save that as something to come back for. So we'll return to JWST later at a later night when I can get on it with a second telescope. Unfortunately, right now, all of my options are clouded out uh, or otherwise closed, and so I cannot actually fire up any of the eye telescopes tonight. That's a shame. But not a huge shame, because unlike some more transient events, like when we tracked Perseverance or uh, Ros um, not Rosetta, um, gosh, what? Lucy. When we tracked the Lucy recently, we only had uh, really one night where it was close enough for my telescope to see it. So with this, 
it's a whole different story. It's going to continue to be something we can observe even more frequently than the Hubble Space Telescope, which normally for me is a very frequent target of opportunity because, uh, because it was launched due east out of Florida, the orbital inclination brings it over Florida again on a fairly frequent basis. But for JWST, it's even even better because it's going to be basically visible any given clear night at the L2 point where it's where it's going to be orbiting around that point. Some nights will bring it uh, higher up into the northern side of the celestial sphere, and some nights will bring it lower into the southern. So some nights will be preferable to others, but generally speaking, it will be more frequently visible than any other space telescope I've. Uh, looked at with this telescope. Ever capture the latest Chinese space station? Not yet. That's one I, I regret not capturing yet. Uh, should definitely try that. Uh, my friend Philip Smith has captured some fantastic pictures. Uh, just captured all kinds of detail uh, on that space station with his telescope. Uh, and so if you go look him up, you'll see some, some great captures of T, uh, Tiangong, I can't pronounce it, but the Chinese space station. At least six months before we get photos of JWST. Yeah, it's going to be a long commissioning process. I see you're answering uh, Kaiser Sosa, it looks like. Yeah, so don't feel so bad, Boris, about it being cloudy in Bulgaria. Uh, even if you can't see it tonight, as long as you have a decent telescope and a decent deep space camera, or, hmm, could even try some fun with the cell phone. That might be one. I've been wanting to make a video about just how deep you can go with a cell phone these days. With the astrophotography mode on, say, a Pixel 4, which is what I have, or, you know, any newer iPhone, you can do some decent entry-level deep space work that honestly captures better images than what I captured when I bought my first digital deep space camera, which was the Mead DSi-1 back in the day. And that that rather low-quality camera uh, had a low-resolution sensor. It was, it was kind of terrible, to be honest. And it finally burned up on its own. It didn't have a fan or anything that it came with. It was just uh, passive Peltier cooling. And it, it didn't didn't last, really. The phones we have now, with their night modes, their astrophotography modes, can capture a much better image. Um, I would still say this camera beats it. Uh, this deep space camera I have here still is going to capture a much better image than mounting a phone to an eyepiece. But nevertheless, you can, you can dip your toes in the water and, and capture some decent images with just what you have in your pocket already. And I'm curious to know just how deep you can go. Like, can you get a magnitude 15 uh, shot of JWST? Probably, if you have a large enough telescope. So I might try that for fun uh, at some point. Oh, Kaiser Cube asks, do I know the angular, angular inclination as the orbit goes north and south relative to Earth? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how far... I think what you're asking is how far north and how far south in declination will it get. I'd have to look. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Tianhe 1. Ah. Yeah, so you found the, the Philip Smith's picture of that, Sam? Yeah, it's, he did some really good work on that recently. I was impressed. Any L2 explanations? Can't seem to grasp. Ah! All right, the way I think of it uh, might not be the most intuitive, but the way I think of it is, okay, you have the you have the telescope headed directly away from the sun relative to Earth, right? So it's, it's going to be sitting or really orbiting a point that is on a line that passes through the Earth and the sun. And you might think, well, how is that a gravitational balancing point? But look at it this way. Earth takes one year to go around the sun once, right? If you are orbiting a little bit further away than the Earth is from the Sun, you should take a little bit longer to orbit around the Sun. But if you're at this gravitational balancing point known as L2, the combined gravitational force of Earth and the Sun working together on your spacecraft will yank you along 
so that it only takes you one year to go around the sun once, even though you're a million miles more distant from the sun than the Earth. And in that way, it stays with the Earth as it orbits around the sun. And so from our perspective traveling around the sun, it appears to be orbiting an invisible point directly away from the sun in our sky and just hanging out with us, traveling with us around the sun. I hope that helps make some sense of it for you. And in a similar vein, but sort of in an opposite direction, the SOHO satellite is at the L1 point. Uh, so is Discover. Uh, the Discover satellite, it's basically orbiting the opposite Lagrange point, closer to the Sun than the Earth by about a million miles. And also because of the combined gravity of Earth and the Sun acting on it, it's at this gravitational balance point where it still takes a full year to go around the Sun, even though if the Earth weren't there, it should take less time to go around the Sun once, because it's a million miles closer to the Sun than we are. But obviously for JWST it makes more sense to put it at L2, where it's a little bit further from the Sun and can get cooler. Looks like I got a shout out from uh, Everyday Astronaut. Thanks, man. Thanks, Tim. Seems like he uh, might be watching. Is he in the chat? I haven't seen him. Well, that should. <laughs> that's probably going to break in a few viewers, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, my, t my Twitter notifications have now formally exploded. I'm going to mute that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And we have a super chat from Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, for $19.99. Thanks for doing this, Scott. Super cool. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. So glad I could do this for everybody tonight. I tell you what, my, my nerves were uh, a little frayed this morning watching that launch and just holding my breath for the whole thing. Uh, but that, that final sight of it separating from the rock it was just absolutely gorgeous so of course I had to put that as the thumbnail uh, on this video <laughs> thanks Tim I appreciate it I mean the great news like I say about JWST is honestly it will be a target available to people all around the world constantly and I suspect, even with the equipment and the technology we now have in our pockets, you have what it takes to do it if you have a, just a simple eyepiece mounting tool and a telescope that can track. I might even try it, it's quite a challenge, but I might even try it with my 4-inch Nexstar scope, just this tiny little grab-and-go scope that's about 400 bucks, and I suspect with this phone and that telescope it might even be possible once the sun shield fully deploys because that will create a nice, big, reflective surface aimed back at Earth. Did I see the speed change with the burn? I didn't see the burn, unfortunately. I was able to get on it just after 9 p.m., uh, which looked, it looked brighter in the very first frame. I haven't seen that happen since. It makes me wonder if something happened there where they were altering the orientation of it a little bit during that moment, which is pretty cool. It might have been a just a random sun flare, just naturally by the angle of the sun to the to the telescope. Uh, but whatever the case, it was definitely definitely at a moment of brighter uh, magnitude there in that very first frame during the webcast here. So I'll go back and review that for sure. So after this is all done tonight, all these frames are going to be put into a time lapse video, which I'll post so you can see it moving here against the background stars and uh, might take a closer up look at it 
to see what's going on there in that first frame where it was brighter. Thanks, Rent-A-Cow. Yeah, I haven't cover covered the uh, the equipment I'm using right now yet, but this is an, as you said, 8-inch LX200 Classic with a F.63 focal reducer on there and an S-Big ST2000 XCM camera, which is a single-shot color camera, true color, uh, and also has a uh, S-Big S -S AO7 adaptive optics unit in use, currently guiding it uh, about 4 hertz. And a 499 Super Chat from Brandon Music. Thank you very much. Ah, so that's a great question, Tim. Uh, can I explain for those of us who are new here how I know it's JWST and how I knew where to look? So I downloaded the coordinates, uh, the ephemeris, where it was predicted to be from JPL. If you go and Google JPL Horizons, you'll find a website and a web app where you can download the orbital elements and or the coordinates of various NASA spacecraft, including JWST. And you can you can uh, set your location and get the exact right ascension and declination coordinates for anything that you want to happen to be tracking. Uh, and so I pulled up the coordinates for JWST, put that into the telescope hand controller, and basically hit slew. And sure enough, right in the middle of where the telescope was pointing was this little streak moving relative to the background stars. Now in a few minutes, maybe 30 minutes or so, it's going to get closer and closer to the edge of the image, and at some point I'm going to have to move it. And what you'll see is it should recenter just by me plugging in the new coordinates of the telescope uh, because my telescope will be moving, hopefully, in the same direction as this object. So we will have co absolute confirmation at that point. Uh, I could also solve for the orbit, and that's something I will ultimately do, is basically solve for the coordinates in every image that I've taken tonight using the stars as a reference point. So that's called astrometry. And uh, you can go to nova.astrometry.net and upload images, including the ones you're seeing here, and it will give you the coordinates of every pixel in the image. And then you can use that to measure the orbit over time. If you know when the picture was taken, where the picture was taken, in this case Florida, and you know uh, the coordinates based on the astrometry, you can solve for the orbit. Uh, I just watched the movie Don't Look Up earlier today, as a matter of fact, and I thought it was a little bit funny. In, in, the, in the intro and the premise to this movie, some astronomers find a comet that's on an impact course for Earth. It's kind of a comedy, but um, bottom line is they, they sit around in a, in a lecture uh, auditorium, sort of, uh, with a whiteboard, and they're trying to figure out by hand what the orbit of this comet is based on the astrometry. And the funny thing is, like, in reality, no one does it that way anymore. No one uses the method of Gauss, which they reference. Nobody does it by hand. You can just plug it into a program like FindOrb and get instant results. Um, and that's what any reasonable person would do if they found a new comet. Um, so uh, that's, that's the beauty of modern technology. We can just plug these things in and get our answers right away. Uh, and that's, that's something you, do, you can do here. You can independently solve for the orbit of the telescope and in that way confirm that it matches the orbit that NASA predicted for the telescope. So that, that'll be the final nail in the coffin as it were on the identification of this object but I'm I'm already 99 percent sure this is JWST. It's the right brightness I was expecting. It's moving in the direction I was expecting and it's uh, it's, uh, it's the right um, about the right amount of motion in each image but I'm, I'm eyeballing that a bit so we'll see some further proof when we recenter the target here in a bit and uh, pull up the new coordinates off JPL. Uh, not tonight. So I do have custom tracking software for doing things like this called Neo Tracker. Uh, it's designed for, for doing this, tracking objects, near Earth objects. Um, but for this, it's not moving fast enough that it's really necessary. Uh, if it were moving a bit faster, where it's covering more of the image in each frame, I could use that to dynamically track it where the telescope is moving to keep up with it. Instead, I'm electing to just move to a static set of coordinates and track the, the relative motion of the background stars rather than the telescope itself, which is why the telescope is streaking and the stars are solid little points. Uh, that allows me to use the adaptive optics as well. 
The adaptive optic optics depend on a guide star, so a, a random star nearby that it's locking onto. And you can see that, that star in the top left corner there shifting constantly. It's measuring how much the atmosphere is shifting the image, how much the telescope motors are shifting the image, and it's compensating for that about four times a second right now, and that produces a much sharper image that way. What focus, oh, focal length is this? So this is a two meter focal length telescope, but with a 0.63 focal reducer. So, uh, what is that? I can't do the math in my head right now. Uh, so the, the effective focal length times 2000 is, I should have known that, 1260, 1260 millimeters. And it looks like I missed a super chat here from Walter Bislin for uh, 20 CHF. Thank you very much for doing this for us. Thank you, Walter. Appreciate your hard work and everything you do. Does, uh, he does some incredible work uh, modeling various things, including uh, flat Earth predictions and things like that, and showing how they don't work, basically, but at a much higher uh, degree of rigor and uh, detail than I could even do. Oh, Sam, yeah, so maybe we're not far enough away, but I may be able to try to track it tomorrow if the weather holds up. That would be cool. If you could track it from where you are, actually, that might start to produce enough topocentric parallax to be detectable. It, you'd be surprised. You don't have to be super-duper far away. Our distance might be just enough. Depends on what camera you're using. Uh, you've got the, the next star 4 sc as well, right? So, uh, maybe. Just maybe. It's worth a shot, anyway. Wouldn't hurt. So, what are you looking at, Danny? So, you're looking at JWST, the, J the James Webb Space Telescope, moving against the background stars right now. It's that little streak that uh, the cursor's pointing out there in the, in the field of view. And you'll see it moving from frame to frame. Each frame is a one-minute exposure with a deep space camera, an S-Big ST2000XCM on an 8-inch Meet Aux 200 Classic telescope. And so we're tracking the stars and allowing the, the James Webb Space Telescope to streak through the view. And you can see it moving frame to frame there. What's one thing I want to see with the web? Oh, that's a great question. I, I mean, the, the first and foremost thing I want to see with the web is its equivalent of the uh, Hubble Deep Field. Um, I think that would be awesome for them to to do that kind of work, looking back, you know, to the edge of time almost, to the beginning of formations of galaxies and stars, and see what that looks like. I, that cannot wait. That is going to be amazing. Canon M50, no special adapters other than the T-adapter. Well, with the T-adapter, um, I can let, I can lend you a... Sometime if we, if we meet up, I'll lend you a, a one and a quarter inch nose piece adapter for that T adapter. I've got a ton of them. Gray Man Media. How much do I think the JWST will be able to see in the next year? Can the telescope see multiple images with each mirror? Um, I'm not sure if they're going to configure it to do that. I think it's all going to be pretty much configured for a single image. Uh, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, what they're, the way they're commissioning it, they're going to try to align those mirror segments to produce a single unified uh, and very crisp image. Uh, as far as what I think it'll be able to see in the next year, I mean, again, I'm, I'm hoping sometime in the next year we can get its first look back as far as it can look. Well, not as far as it can look, but at least as far as Hubble's look, maybe farther uh, into some deep field where we're seeing back to the edge of, basically the edge of formation of galaxies in the cosmological time scale. I mean, just billions of years in the past. Uh, looking back even further than the Hubble Deep Fields. That will be amazing. That will be... That will be absolutely fantastic to see. What is the distance from Earth right now? Great question. Let's look it up. Uh, let me look it up off of JPL right now. So according to JPL, we are now at 2.39 Universal Time. And according to JPL, looks like the distance is 
0.0009 astronomical units. If I'm reading that right. Is that the delta? Is that the delta? No. Uh, where's the top here? Yeah, that's the delta. Okay. So. That is equivalent to 149,106 kilometers. So let's see here. That is going to be 49,106 divided by 384, 400. That is point three, close to 0.39 times the distance to the moon. So almost 40% the distance to the moon away. And it's going to get further than the moon, much further than the moon, um, once it gets out to L2, the, the ultimate destination. It's Lagrange point 2. Did they say how long to zero the mirrors? So, yeah, it's going to take about six months. Uh, it's a slow process of gradually cooling down the telescope's instruments, cooling down the segments of the telescope, getting it down to its operating temperature, and aligning and commissioning the mirrors. Uh, that whole process, these mirror segments that it, it is made of, uh, are designed to be aligned and moved relative to each other to uh, sharpen the focus and get the best possible image. So that whole process is going to take about six months. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I'll add uh, I'll add some spam bot text to my block words list later. I was not uh, not anticipating the shout out. So thanks again, Tim Dot. Appreciate it. We've got almost two thousand viewers now. So I tell you what. Now that we have almost two thousand viewers, and it's been a bit, we've got about uh, 29 images down now. I'm gonna hold on. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the image taking for just a second. And we will move the telescope and make sure that we really are looking at JWST by pulling in the latest coordinates and seeing if it recenters properly, which it should. So we are now 2.42 universal time. So I'm scroll to that. Okay. So we'll go ahead and pull in these coordinates. And we're now 2.43. Okay, go ahead a couple minutes here pull in these coordinates and see where it ends up. Now, the unfortunate thing about doing that is we probably just lost our guide star. So, let's see what we have to work with on guide stars now. Uh, let's see. Well, we can't guide quite as quickly as we could before. We do have something there. Okay, we've got, we've got one we can work with there, but we're going to have to guide a little slower than before. See if I can get away with 0.6 seconds. Eesh, that's that's cutting it too close. We'll have to go to 0.8. Even that's really cutting it close on signal to noise ratio. 
but it is working. It is working. Uh, no, it's not working. Okay, it's it's going it's going bonkers. Yikes! Okay, let me try one second guide speed. Even this, it's oof, guys. Okay, what's going on there? It's bouncing. It's bouncing pretty bad. It might actually. Is it trying to walk onto a double star? Hmm. Let's see. That's better. Yeah, hold that steady. Okay, so it's got to be a one second guiding exposure. It's not great, but we'll make it work. Alright, let's go and take a picture. Keep an eye on that guiding. Make sure we're not doing anything bonkers with it. So now the question becomes, where will JWST show up? It should show up closer to the top center of the image here. Fifteen seconds left on the exposure. How many miles away is it currently? Well, I just checked the distance a minute ago, and it was about 40% uh, the distance to the moon, or about 149,000 kilometers. There it is. Right where expected. So, yeah, confirmed. We have JWST. And that's it right there. Fresh coordinates put it right back where it was at the start of the webcast. So, we're moving in the right direction. It's exactly where we expect JWST to be. So just in case it helps, I'm going to go turn off my office light. Can we see this telescope after it reaches destination? Yes, that is the goal. That is the hope there, space for everyone. According to my math, assuming this uh, reflective sun shield is almost completely reflective, which it should be, uh, and its surface area of about 300 square meters, even at a distance of one and a half million kilometers, it should be apparent magnitude of about 15, which is definitely within reach of a telescope like this with this kind of camera. I got the coordinates from uh, JPL Horizons, so if you Google JPL Horizons, you can find a website where you can put in your location and get the curtain coordinates of the James Webb Space Telescope as well as other NASA spacecraft. Alright, so I will be right back in Jiffy. I'm just going to turn off an office light in case it's causing any issues there, any kind of glare. But in the meantime, I'm not going to leave you hanging in silence. I'm going to go ahead and fire up some Stellar Drone for the background here. So enjoy, I'll be right back.
All right, sorry I was gone so long there. I accidentally spilled a drink all over myself. And I see the telescope's fighting itself a little bit on the guiding, so we're gonna, we're gonna stop that for a second. Okay. In fact, we'll reset position on uh, JWST. Maybe we'll get a better guide star in view. That's what we'll do. So, just bear with me. I'm gonna pull up the latest coordinates and uh, slew the telescope to the current position of JWST. Also, note to self, don't don't walk around in the dark when there's telescope cases laying around without a flashlight. My flashlight broke earlier tonight, and it's left me in the dark, literally. Uh, which was not a good combination, as it turns out. So, yeah, I, uh, I totally tripped over one of my own cases. Fortunately, I didn't hit the telescope, but I did spill a drink all over myself. Not good. So, we're now 3.02 Universal Time. I think fundamentally the issue there with the guiding and the reason the stars getting are all getting all streaky there is that we didn't have a bright enough guide star to really work with. So give me a second here. Jesus. Okay. Okay, so we got some new stars to work with here. Maybe something brighter that we can do a little faster guiding on. The A07 really wants a bright guide star to work with. Yeah, that's much better in terms of signal to noise ratio and everything else. Let's try that. Yeah, that's much better. Okay. I bet that'll hold steady. So we'll reset now and do a new run of 60 second exposures. So now we're back up to 4.4 hertz guiding. Much, much better. Okay. And I apologize. I know I've not looked at the chat since I had the little incident <laughs> tripping over my own case. We have a $10 super chat here from Cinnamon Control. Great work. Keep it up. Question. Do you expect to see the upper stage as well? How do we know this is JWST and not that? It's a great question. So for one thing, we know that um, this object is right where the telescope is basically pointing. And we'll see when this image comes in. It's a little hard to tell here because of the the streakiness of the previous image, but uh, I, I did not see anything else streaking through the image, and JWST seems to be ending up right where the telescope is slewing to as we update the coordinates, pulling them down from JPL. At this point, the upper stage is far enough from JWST that I don't really expect to necessarily see it in the same field of view, which is only about half a degree wide, only about the width of the full moon across the image. And this is the only thing I'm seeing here that is moving frame to frame. Now we'll we'll take a look here and make sure there's nothing else. I'll zoom out for this exposure. So we'll leave it zoomed out and just verify there's nothing else moving in frame. If I used a much wider field of view with a shorter focal length telescope, I do expect I would probably be able to pick up the uh, the upper stage. But at this point, it's separated enough from JWST that uh, it will not end up in the field of view of my main telescope. If launch occurred, you know, much later in the day and we were closer to the time of launch, then yeah, you would still see it. But at this point, they're getting further and further apart. And 499 from Peter... J uh, I'm going to butcher that last name, sorry. Uh, Jer Jared? Jared? 
Uh, would you be able to see JWST with your eyes looking through the eyepiece? Or is it so dim you have to have a long exposure camera? Another great question. Uh, I haven't measured it here, but generally speaking, based on what I'm seeing, I would say with my telescope, I would really struggle to see this by eye through the eyepiece. Might be possible, but it'd be very faint. You would have to use averted vision and really be looking closely, I suspect. Just based on how bright it looks relative to the other stars in the frame. The brightest stars here in frame would show up in the eyepiece. That is mm, kind of borderline. Maybe, though. Yeah, maybe. Um, and that's with an 8-inch telescope. If you, have, you know, if you have a smaller telescope, it could be a real challenging object. Um, binoculars, probably not. Uh, but if you have a decent sized telescope, yeah, it, it should be possible with averted vision if you're, you know, if you know how to not look directly at it, but look kind of away from it to get the best sensitivity on your eyes. And that's because you're a little bit of physiology here for you. The uh, cone cells of your eyes that provide color to your eyes uh, are less sensitive than the rods, but the, the density of cones is highest and near the fovea in the center of your vision, but the rod density is greater further away from the center of your vision. So the peripheral parts of your vision have greater sensitivity to light, uh, even though they have lower resolution. So if you look away from it a little bit with what they call averted vision, you'll see you'll see more sensitivity. Oh, I'm very quiet, they say. Oh, my mic's all the way up. Let me move my mic closer to my mouth. Hopefully that'll help. So, I need to also update where JWST is actually up here. Seeing it move frame to frame there. I'm not seeing anything else move. I'm going to watch more carefully on this frame, but I'm not seeing anything else move. Yeah, so in just looking through with your eye, yeah, just looking through the eyepiece there, not not at the image. <laughs> I should have been more specific about that. How did I find it? I pulled the coordinates from JPL's Horizons system. If you Google JPL Horizons, you'll go to a, you'll find a NASA website where you can download the coordinates of JWST for your own location. You plug in your location and the time, it'll give you the current coordinates. Uh, either in right ascension and declination or altitude azimuth of the uh, JWST uh, space telescope. Looks like we had a satellite streaking through in an earlier frame that I'm looking at, uh, but that, that was about 10 minutes ago on the live stream. Okay, as this image comes in, I'm going to look real careful here. Yeah, that's the only thing I see moving. I don't spot anything else moving in frame, so, you know, that's that's kind of what I expect. I don't really expect that uh, we'll see the uh, upper stage. But at least we have a decent guide star now, so I'm going to stick with this field of view for as long as I can, because we have a real good guide star to use, bright and... Uh, readily visible to the telescope so we can run these fast guiding exposures and a five dollar super chat from Blue Marble Science thanks for all the great work you do go JWST thanks Blue Marble Science appreciate it and now I'll come in here and move my little marker there's JWST right there. So yeah, as before, we've we've moved the telescope several times. Every single time, it's put JWST near the center of the field of view, or at least where it's centering up the pointing. It's uh, the pointing position of the telescope is a little bit north in the field of view. It's not directly in the center of the field of view. It's been putting objects that it slews to just above center. So that's where I expect it to put it in the image, and that's where it's been putting it every single time. 
So it's right on target, um, and it's moving in the right direction at the right speed. And all of that tells me that's definitely JWST. That's too much to be a coincidence. And we'll get more exact science out of it later when I do astrometry on these images and actually solve for the orbit independently. And another super chat, $5 Canadian from uh, Cirrus. Thanks for the stream. Cool to see. For those of us without protractors, what general direction are we looking? Uh, we're looking in the constellation Orion, actually, tonight. Uh, near, kind of near Rigel, by the look of it. Uh, a little bit below Orion's belt, from what I can tell. I'm just eyeballing it based on where the telescope's pointing in the sky. How far is it now? That's a great question. Let's uh, let's get an updated distance. So we are at 312 universal time right now. Current distance 0 0.00102 astronomical uni units, which in kilometers is uh, 152,844 kilometers. Now that is also um, going to be probably distance to telescope, not distance to the center of the Earth, but that is direct line distance between my telescope and the JWST. Uh, there's another great question. Do other satellites stay parked at the L2 point? Um, oh gosh, is Gaia at L2? I think. I think. I'm going to Google that, but off the top of my head, I want to say ESA's Gaia telescope is also orbiting L2, but I could be wrong. Let me see. Da, da, da. Yeah, Sun Earth L2. Yeah, I was right. So the Gaia mission is an astrometry mission. Now I mentioned astrometry earlier in this stream, but what do I mean by an astrometry mission? So Gaia is a space telescope designed for measuring the positions of the stars so that other science can be done primarily. Um, one of the main products of that mission is an updated and very detailed database on the exact coordinates of uh, the stars that it's looking at and it's looking at a more uh, expansive set of stars than previous missions. Uh, so, that way, when you're, say, tracking an object like JWST tonight, and you solve for the coordinates, if you use the updated Gaia database, you get more exact data because you know you have a database that um, contains more precise coordinates of the stars, and uh, that gives you more precise measurements of everything else that you're that you're measuring its position in space uh, one of the other benefits to a mission like that is you can you can very precisely measure the proper motion of stars over time how they're traveling relative to our Sun as well as parallax how far away they are from our solar system so there's a lot of useful data that comes out of uh, the Gaia mission which is also at the L2 point Where will JWST settle in the sky after two weeks? Well, it'll be orbiting the L2 point, and so roughly it'll be orbiting around a point directly opposite the sun in the sky. How many degrees will the orbit measure in the sky? That's a great question. I should have looked that up before the stream, and I, I didn't. So I'll have to look that up for you later. Um, 
But what I plan to do at the end of all this is take these images that we're collecting tonight, solve for the orbit independently, propagate that out using uh, Rebound in Linux, uh, and show a visualization of that whole process of it traveling out there. Now, of course, uh, that will simply be sort of Newtonian mechanics, not accounting for course corrections along the way. So I'm not sure exactly how precisely that will line up with its true final orbit around L2. We'll see. It'll be fun. Um, I don't think it'll be quite precise because it won't necessarily include any of those course corrections or final burns settling it into its final orbit. But um, I can also take the elements from JPL the predicted orbital elements of JWST in its final orbit and propagate that out as well and do a visualization of that so I can show that and then um, translate that into degrees on the sky, how wide that orbit will look on the sky. Where can you go to get that data? So the data I'm using to find it is from JPL's Horizons uh, website. So I'm gonna, let me see if I can just drop a link to that in the chat. Yeah, I'm going to drop it in the chat, but it'll it'll scroll out pre pretty quickly. Uh, let me see. Can I turn on slow mode? I think it's I think it's time. We have uh, 3,400 viewers in chat, so I'm going to have to turn on uh, slow scrolling mode here if I can. I haven't ever had to do that before, actually. Question is now, how do I do that? <laughs> Thanks, Kaiser Cube. And another $5 super chat from uh, Cyrates. As per Scott Manley, JWST can work 45 degree pitch, 5 degree roll, 360 degree yaw. Slow mode. Okay. Hopefully that turned on slow mode. There we go. Sorry, I'm trying to make life a little bit easier for my moderators as well. <laughs> Chances Gaia and JWST collide. Uh, well, hopefully zero. Hopefully they manage that. Uh, and really, uh, the orbits that they're going to have around L2, they're pretty large. That's a lot of space to work with. I mean, it'd be pretty incredible if they actually collided. Will the general public be able to view images from JWST as after it reaches a million mile journey? Yes. Uh, those images should be provided to the public, although, as with Hubble, I would expect there to be a certain embargo period for new images uh, that were requested by various scientists. 
the way it usually works right now with Hubble, uh, for example, is that scientists will have a period of, um, I think about a year of exclusivity, where they are the only ones who can download the images that they requested. So that gives them time to study those images and publish their results so that they don't get scooped by other scientists who didn't put in the original proposal, didn't put in the work to get that particular object uh, imaged by Hubble. After that, it's opened up to the public and everyone can download them. Uh, and there's actually a website you can go to for viewing the latest uh, data, the data made available to the public uh, most recently, within, say, the last week or two weeks or month from Hubble, and you can just download whatever has just become publicly available. Uh, and a four ninety nine super chat from David Stanaway. What other things have I tracked? Well, that's a great question. Uh, quite a number of things. So I developed software for tracking low Earth orbit satellites, like, um, like the ISS. Ooh, we've got another satellite right there. As a matter of fact, just passing above JWST. That's that that long streak you see going through the image there. So I've tracked ISS, Hubble a bunch of uh, low Earth orbit satellites, even some higher altitude satellites like uh, the Magnetospheric Multi-Scale Mission. Um, but in addition to that, I've also tracked a number of deep space missions, uh, such as um, Lucy, uh, the Perseverance rover. Uh, in fact, Perseverance rover, I tracked it with this telescope as well as a telescope on the other side of the country to get some topocentric parallax and actually measure the distance directly using simultaneous observations. So that was some, some fun stuff on that. So yeah, we do a lot of uh, a lot of satellite tracking around here and even deep space probe tracking here. Oh, and another satellite. We must be passing by the geostationary uh, band, the Clark Belt, I'm guessing. I'm g just guessing here, but based on the sheer number of satellites appearing right now at 10, almost 10.30 at night, that strongly suggests we are looking near a bunch of geostationary satellites. So, I'm going to just plug in the coordinates right now. Yeah, we're just above the Clark Belt in the sky, but there are some probably satellites in graveyard orbits around here. Ooh, that looks like uh, EEHF-4 is nearby. I'm not sure if that's one of them we just saw. It's launched in 2018. That's a that'd probably be an Air Force communications satellite, I think. But I don't know if that's what we were just looking at. But yeah, there are some satellites at a sort of geosynchronous altitude. Their inclination isn't necessarily exactly zero. Uh, AEHF-4, for example, has an inclination of about 2.7 degrees. So it's not perfectly geostationary. It'll form sort of a figure eight in the sky. But uh, we're getting close to the Clark Band. As this thing uh, heads down... Well, actually, I mean, it's... The other thing we have to keep in mind, I sometimes forget this myself, 
but because of the A07 and you got this mirror in there, you're looking at uh, an inverted, vertically inverted view. It's actually heading away from the Clark Belt, but it's still close enough to it. It's not moving fast enough that it's getting away fast enough that you won't see the occasional geosynchronous satellite that's uh, nearly zero degrees inclination, something like AEHF-4, which is not exactly on the uh, Clark Belt, but it's close close to this zero degree inclination belt of geostationary satellites. Technically geosynchronous, not geostationary. Differences, so geosynchronous is a satellite that's in an orbit high enough that it completes one orbit per day. But if its inclination is not zero degrees, then it's not geostationary, meaning it does not remain over the exact same spot over Earth all day long. It will actually make a little circuit over the Earth. It'll travel north and then south and then north again and make a little, usually like a little eight figure eight pattern on the ground and correspondingly in the sky. And so an example of that would be the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's in a geosynchronous orbit, so it completes one orbit per day, but it is not geostationary. It does move relative to the ground and it moves in the sky. But you also have satellites in sort of graveyard orbits that are no longer geostationary. They've drifted a bit uh, and they have a little bit of inclination to them and they're usually in a higher altitude than geostationary satellites. So they don't actually complete, they're not actually geosynchronous anymore really. They're slightly less than that. They uh, take a little bit longer than a day to complete one orbit usually. But they're, they're in the same general region of the sky and so you'll see them floating around out there too when you're hanging out in this sort of region. It can be real annoying when you're trying to image Orion, nebulae and Orion and you get run over by a bunch of geostationary satellites depending on the time of year. Ah, Sled Dog 123 asks, can I describe an orbit around the L2 point? Visualizations show a circle around it, but that doesn't seem accurate with the ball on top of a hill metaphor. Ah, it's a great question. And that gets into more advanced sort of orbital dynamics of how all that works. So they don't put it directly at the L2 point for one. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, they describe it with a metaphor of a ball on top of a hill. You're trying to balance it right at the tip of this hill, and any slight deviation from being perfectly balanced is going to cause it to roll off to one side, and it will drift away from the L2 point. It's not a stable point. It doesn't want to stay there, as it were. It's not really drawn there. It's um, it will it will drift away under the force of uh, the gravity of the planets and the moon if it's not perfectly balanced. So they instead put it in, or in an orbit around the L2 point. Um, and so it's more stable that way. It's something they can control better uh, by giving it some momentum around the L2 point. And uh, honestly, I'd have to look into the dynamics of that better myself to understand it fully mathematically. But the way you can think of it in general, and this is kind of how I described it earlier, is you have this satellite, this... Uh, JWST space telescope traveling with the Earth around the Sun a million miles further from the Sun than the Earth so it should take longer than a year to complete one orbit but because of the additional gravity of the Earth it's at the right distance that it will get drawn along so that it actually does take the same amount of time as Earth one year to go around the Sun and so it appears to travel with us and so you'll see this often with Trojan asteroids at various Lagrange points of other planets, and even uh, Earth has uh, Trojan asteroids. And they will not be sitting still at the Lagrange point, but they'll be tracing out circuits within the Lagrange point, so in this sort of gravitational valley uh, that is mm, kind of stable. Uh, and they'll have some momentum in, within that region, and they'll be traveling in, a, in an orbit around an invisible point, uh, a, a Lagrange point. And it's the same sort of thing here with JWST, it's just an artificial object that we're putting there deliberately. $20 super chat from Sonata Systems. Can I track DART until it impacts its target, or has that already happened? hasn't happened yet, but it's not really feasible for me to track it out to its target. Um, 
whereas I could track the Lucy and did track Lucy after its launch, it was heading away from the sun as it departed Earth. DART, its trajectory actually took it closer to the sun in the sky and made it virtually impossible for me to track. It was only barely above the horizon at twilight, um, not really feasible to track it. Uh, so, yeah, that one just didn't work out just based on the geometry of the situation. Conversely, uh, this is why it's sometimes very hard to detect asteroids, if not impossible, to detect them prior to impact, at least on the orbit where the impact is going to occur. If they're coming at Earth from the direction of the Sun, and they're close to the Sun in the sky from our point of view, they essentially are coming at us from our blind spot. We can't see them with our telescopes. That's what happened with Chelyabinsk uh, back in 2012, I think it was. Uh, and it hit a region in Russia with no warning, and there really couldn't have been any warning, at least on that particular orbit, because it was coming at us from the direction of the sun. How much room is in L2 in kilometers? Well, that's a good question, and that gets into, um, yeah, I'd have to I'd have to look that up, actually. It's probably a bit of a fuzzy edge, not really a hard edge, I'm guessing, in terms of where you cut that region off and say, well, it's not really there anymore. Um, and how much, you know, how much fuel are you willing to spend to stay there? It doesn't take a whole lot to stay there, uh, where they're putting J James Webb, uh, but... You know, it does take a little bit. Yeah. I'd have to get into the math on that. I don't know off the top of my head. It's one thing to calculate how far away it is, but, you know, in terms of defining a size... Yeah, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit trickier off the top of my head there. Could have some fun with that though, using rebound. So I use rebound to do dynamic simulations of orbits in Linux. Um, used to use Orsa, but I couldn't get it to work anymore with modern versions of Linux. It doesn't seem like it's been updated and maintained. Uh, last I checked, so I started using rebound instead, which requires a little more coding to do, but um, also gives you more freedom in that sense. Yeah, it's great. It's Wikipedia on describing the... I'm looking at the Wikipedia on describing halo orbits around the Lagrange points, but it doesn't flat out say, well, this is, you know, as wide as you can possibly make it before it becomes no longer stable. That's a that's a whole subject for an entire video right there. Sounds like a Scott Manley video to me. And a 499 super chat from Grant Barnes. Someone mentioned six months until sensors cool down. Is the heat due to space itself or drag heat from launch? Cheers and a happy new year. Happy new year. I mean, some of that, a lot of that is going to be due to thermal inertia from launch, but moreover, the sun shield isn't even deployed yet, right? It's going to be a few days till that happens. So, um, you know, it's still being heated even now by the sun, and it's not in its sort of protected configuration where the sun shield's fully deployed and it's starting to cool off. And they also, the flight controllers are going to control that process. They don't want it to cool down too quickly. Um, you want it to be a gradual cool down process. You want some control over that. Uh, you don't want to thermally shock anything by just smacking it with, you know, complete cold right away or sucking all the heat out of it, really, transferring the heat out of it too quickly. There's... Um, Years ago, there was this video, this time-lapse video I saw. I wish I had it handy. It was pretty cool, but also disturbing in a way. Um, showing what happens to a CCD camera if you 
cool it down too quickly or heat it up too quickly using thermoelectric cooling. Uh, Rock Mallon makes these uh, thermoelectrically cooled video cameras for visual, sort of vi electronically assisted astronomy. Kind of doing what we're doing tonight, but in a faster sense with less processing involved. And basically he showed what a lower quality camera would do where the engineer hadn't properly factored in the amount of time they should allow for for the thing to heat back up after turning off the thermoelectric cooling. You should stage that shutdown process and not just uh, hit it with a ton of heat from uh, waste heat from the camera as soon as you turn off the thermoelectric cooling. And what it did is it actually deformed the CCD from the thermal shock and you saw this uh, in, in collecting images from it as that process happened. It produced what looked like this sort of uh, brightness through the image that passed through the image almost like a, a circular wave from the center emanating outwards as it actually deformed the CCD slightly and started to strain the uh, soldering joint connections and everything else and just damaged it. Um, you definitely don't want to do that to your electronics. So they're carefully controlling the, this process of getting it to these extreme temperatures in a staged and, and controlled fashion and making sure everything is, is proceeding properly as designed. And a new membership from Ashes of Owls. Thank you very much and welcome. So just to let anyone know who's new here, I do um, do some coding and develop tracking software for satellites. Uh, not really using it tonight because it's not necessary. Um, but I do have Neo Tracker, Sat Tracker, UFO Tracker. So uh, Sat Tracker is what I use and developed for tracking low Earth orbit satellites like ISS, Hubble, and others. Uh, UFO Tracker is a program that I created for tracking rocket launches. And so you can use a joystick and also use predictive tracking to follow rocket launches with off the shelf telescope hardware. It's been tested with uh, Celestron Next Star as well as the Meet Alex 200. And then Neo Tracker for tracking near Earth objects, including, satellite, or including artificial objects like this, or um, comets and asteroids that are passing close to Earth. And so uh, I make compiled executables available for download to all channel members for free. So if you join as a member, you can access that. So if you have a telescope that can use that, uh, you can download those. That's one of the perks of uh, channel membership. But the source code is also available for free on GitHub. So I have a GitHub page. You can download the source code and compile it yourself if you would like. But if you want to support the channel and support the work that I do, uh, that is much appreciated. And thank you very much for joining as a member. Yeah, 6 degrees Kelvin is no joke. <laughs> says Little Musk. Yeah, <laughs> it's really, really no joke. It's uh, some serious business. I should update my pointer here. JWST's made it down this far. Field of view is wider than this, though. We're, we're looking way over here. Can pull it this way. Pull it down a bit, too. Oh, where is it? How did I lose it? Okay, it's up there. There we go. Oh, thank you, Ashes of Owls. My background. So, oh, there's a there's a long story. I'll I'll make a long story short. So, I'm an amateur astronomer. Um. I did take some astronomy classes in college during my undergrad years, just for fun. Uh, took an observational astronomy course, which was sort of an upper-level undergrad course, uh, with a really nice grounding of the mathematics behind observational astronomy, um, how to tra translate coordinates into different uh, reference frames, uh, calculating sidereal time, you know, all the basic stuff. But from that point on, I was self-taught on all of this. I grew up on the Space Coast watching shuttle launches, saw most of the space shuttle launches in, in person as a kid, um, and 
always had a fascination with it, of course, but really got bit by the bug when I saw Saturn through a telescope for the first time. And over the years, gradually got better and better telescopes and wanted to learn more and more and, and did a lot of homework myself, going to various university libraries, um, checking out books on uh, how to calculate various aspects of uh, observational astronomy. Um, and finally got into programming and applied those skills there. And that's, that's where you get to have some real fun developing software for things like satellite tracking. That's been an absolute blast. And, and that was one of my goals. I, I kind of saw a niche, a need for something there where there, there were programs out there for doing satellite tracking, but they lacked one thing that I felt would have made them much more powerful, and that was video-based guidance. So uh, Brent Beauchart's satellite tracker back in the day is what I used to use. And you could correct for tracking errors with a mouse or a joystick, but those were crude methods, I felt. And I really wanted to develop something that would use video input to automatically correct for any tracking error. And that's what I developed with Sat Tracker, and it's been brilliant. It's, it's worked great. You can see the videos on this channel of, of the space station, and others have gotten good results, too. I'm still working out some bugs with, with other people's setups and trying to make it cross-compatible with as many telescope types as possible. And it's, it's been a slow process, but I'm gradually making progress there. So still very much developing that in my free time. Um, but this is not my profession. Uh, I have a PhD, but it's not in astronomy. It's actually in neuroscience. Uh, so, yes, I'm a scientist, but not an astronomer. But I also spent a lot of time from a young age and, and through college and beyond learning more and more about it and uh, trying to apply my what skill I have in improving the hobby of amateur astronomy as much as possible, especially where it regards uh, satellite tracking. It's always been a, a personal fascination of mine. And it, it, that itself, I feel, partly came from seeing images in Sky and Telescope back in the day of amateurs who, back during Apollo, documented Apollo missions traveling to and from the moon with their telescopes, taking pictures of them. And I thought that was incredible that you could do that, that you could see these spacecraft traveling to and from the moon, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers away. And so that combined with the significance, the historical significance of those missions inspired me to say, you know, my generation and the generations to come should also take the responsibility of documenting, independently documenting the missions that are yet to come into deep space and beyond as much as possible with modern technology. And so that translated into trying to improve the software that's out there for tracking ISS, tracking now the SpaceX Dragon missions, uh, all of that. And I, I, I'm proud to say I feel like I have made a contribution there that's been useful and enabled myself and others to start uh, doing our doc, you know, improving our, our ability to document those missions. And here tonight we have another example of it. We have the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to Hubble in a lot of ways. Um, and we're able now to document it and independently track it and uh, document its voyage out to the L2 point. Um, even after it arrives at L2, we'll still be able to see it, but I think it's important, again, to document it from as early as possible to get those images as it heads out there and, you know, record that for posterity so that future generations can be reminded of our early steps out into the solar system. And we have a couple new channel members. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chris, Sheehan and, uh, Chris Sheehan and uh, Curtis Horn. Thank you very much for joining. Let's go L2. Absolutely. What software am I using to do... Oh, electric, electronically assisted astronomy. EAA, -E -A, I think that's what that stands for in that case, uh, electronically assisted astronomy. So the imaging right now is being done with CCD soft, which is definitely, <laughs> definitely older software, but it gets the job done and works well with this older hardware, the uh, ST2000XCM and SBIG A07 adaptive optics.
Oh, uh, another great question here from uh, Darren Brayett. Um, hello, Astronomy Live. How often does this image update refresh? It's on a one-minute exposure. So if you look at the bottom right, you can actually see the blue bar filling up for each exposure. 60-second exposures, that's when the image will update at the end of 60 seconds. What magnitude would I estimate it to be now? That's a good question. It's... Let me see if I can figure that out roughly based on... Um, let me pull in the latest coordinates that it's at right now and see what it looks like. You know, you can kind of estimate it just eyeballing it relative to these other neighboring stars. So let me see what they're at, what some of these neighboring stars are at. So we are now 347 universal time. I'm going to pull up Sky Safari and set it to the same coordinates. So, coordinates right now. 519.5. Roughly 519.50. Five hours, 19 minutes, 50 seconds, right ascension. And negative one degree, 46 minutes. Do, do, do. And 50.8 seconds declination. And this is going to be an inverted vertical view. Okay. So I think I see the star pattern I'm seeing in Sky Safari. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's the one. Okay. So in Sky Safari, I can tell right where we're looking at. Um, WST is now down here. I'm just going to move the cursor over here. So I, I'm seeing these three stars in Sky Safari. JWST is here. So that star just to the left of JWST looks like it's roughly the same brightness. It's roughly the same size in the image. In this case, because these are point-like light sources, size corresponds to brightness. And according to Sky Safari Pro, uh, that star is magnitude 12.6. So I'd estimate JWST is about the same, probably about magnitude 12 and change. Just a very rough, quick estimation there. What city am I near? Uh, south of Tampa, let's say. Is it farther than the moon now? No, I don't believe so. Uh, let's get the current distance. So we're at uh, 3.50 universal time. hundred and fifty seven thousand two hundred and nine kilometers so we're coming up on approaching uh, half distance to the moon but we're actually right now at, what are we at? 157 209 divided by 384 400 so we're at still uh, about 40 percent almost 41 percent the distance to the moon People are getting buffering. What's going on here? Um, hold 
Autobahn, Mann. <sighs> Heard the scampering behind me. There's a nice big bunny there. Stream status poor. I don't know why. We got a tumbling satellite there with the repeating dots. I don't know if anyone can hear me. <laughs> Hopefully uh, the stream will come back. My uh, uh, OBS is telling me I've, I'm all green here. I should be should be five by five. Andrew Knoll Kroll says I am. Um, yeah, should be fine. But YouTube may be having its own problems. What is the time it'll take to reach the desired position? So I think it's going to take about a month to get in position and get deployed, I think. But I have to look at the timeline again to see how that relates to just its motion out to L2. Uh, there was a pretty good... I'm going to give him a shout-out. There's a, There was a pretty good... Um, Pretty good animation of the orbit that I retweeted earlier tonight by Tony Dunn. Looks like late January it starts to get out to the L2 point, but you know, it takes a while for it to fully sort of settle in. Um, but I'll give you a and complete one orbit of L2, but I'll give you a, a link here in the chat to Tony Dunn's animation that shows it quite nicely. So for those just joining, we're looking at uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. We can see other satellites occasionally passing through the field of view, like this right here, this line, this uh, line with these dots in it. That's a satellite, probably something in a graveyard orbit, probably um, those dots are flares from brief moments of uh, brightness from the sun, reflecting off the satellite as it tumbles. It's now gone, but it was there for a second. The cursor's uh, on the screen, that JWST is pointing right where JWST is, and we're occasionally updating the position of the telescope to keep it in the field of view, and watching as it moves relative to the background stars as it heads away from Earth out to the L2 point. It was launched earlier this morning, and uh, seems to be going well so far. Let me see if I can identify what satellite that was. Not showing up in. Yeah, it's not showing up in Sky Safari Pro. But Sky Safari Pro's database doesn't include, in particular, uh, a lot of classified satellites, and it's not entirely comprehensive. So, who knows what that was? But we are in in the sky. We're close to we're in the constellation Orion, basically, and we're close to where the Clark Belt is. So there are geosynchronous satellites and satellites just above geosynchronous orbit in the graveyard orbit that tend to pass through the field of view here relatively frequently. It'll make for an interesting time lapse for sure.
and a new membership from uh, Trimera B. Thank you very much for joining. Appreciate your support. So for those of you from joining from uh, Everyday Astronaut, I suspect a lot of people are coming over from his shout out earlier tonight. I've worked with him on helping him with some of the rocket tracking that he's done in collaboration with Cosmic Perspective uh, with telescopes they've used uh, for tracking launches starting with the in-flight abort test um, prior to the first crew launch of uh, conducted by SpaceX. So it's been, it's been fun collaborating with him and hopefully we'll have opportunities in the future for that as well. But uh, any, anyone who joins as a member gets free access to all of uh, the compiled versions of my programs, including UFO Tracker, uh, which is what Cosmic Perspective is used and Everyday Astronauts used on his streams for uh, tracking Starship, tracking uh, various Falcon launches, things like that. So thank you for joining. Appreciate it. Have I noticed an impact from the growth of satellite constellations in LEO? Great question, David Stanaway. Now, I have tracked um, Starlink satellites, sometimes deliberately, sometimes not deliberately. I have noticed that um, occasionally, you know, you'll see satellites streaking through the field of view here. Tonight, it's it's not going to be Starlink so much, especially at this time of night and in the middle of the winter. Um, at this latitude, you really won't see Starlink satellites. At higher latitudes, you, you can see them uh, around the clock, especially closer to summer. Uh, for me here in Florida, it's not as much of an impact. Uh, I've done videos on this before, and, and it very much depends on your location as to how much of an impact it will have, and your latitude is a big part of that. Um, nevertheless, I have seen Starlink satellites uh, popping up in the background of uh, wide field camera shots when I'm tracking ISS. Occasionally I'll see another satellite uh, in the wide field camera, uh, the viewfinder camera, which I'm using to actually track the space station um, for the main camera. They don't show up in the main camera, but they'll show up in the wide field camera and it'll be like, oh, okay, there's another satellite there just by happenstance. What is that? Well, statistically speaking, more often it's a Starlink satellite. Um, it's you know something that's happening with increasing frequency because ISS is uh, at such an altitude that if it's visible then so are the Starlink satellites pretty much and so you know if ISS were passing over right now for example I wouldn't be able to see it it'd be in Earth's shadow uh, this late at night at this latitude in order for it to be passing over it would have to be in Earth's shadow pretty much um, but then again, so are the Starlink satellites for the most part. So, as I said, it, it depends on time of year, it depends on the time of night, it depends on your latitude as to whether there's any impact at all for visual astronomy or even CCD-based astronomy. But if this were summer, and especially if I were up at higher latitudes, then yeah, you, you would see significant impact around the clock at this kind of... Um, with this kind of imaging, where you're really detecting dim objects like JWST magnitude 12, way dimmer than anything you can see by eye. Has there been any problems yet? Not that I've heard. Hopefully there aren't. I'm sorry. Red's rhetoric just sent me something very funny. Uh, how big are these exposure image files uh, data sizes? Uh, that's a good, great question. So these are 1600 by 1200 images. So the raw FITS files, uh, but they are also, you know, one shot color uh, FITS files. But they are, oh gosh, I'd say three or four megs a piece, maybe. Maybe a bit more. I mean, they are much bigger than they would be if you were saving compressed JPEGs, of course. Uh, but still, it's not... It's not unreasonable. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll just check right now. Let's see. What are we looking at? In terms of size. File size. Come on. Where's directory? Yeah, okay. So these are... Yeah. 
I was probably overestimating it there. These are three point, about 3.8 megabytes a piece. Uh, not, not too bad, really. But they are only 1600 by 1200 images. You know, much lower resolution than what you would get today on your cell phone. The trade-off is this camera is designed for this job. It's thermoelectrically cooled, so it's holding a set point temperature, which is very important when you're trying to calibrate the image using a dark frame. You're, you want the dark frame calibration image to be at the same temperature as all your other images, which you can do when you're actively controlling the temperature. Uh, it's also a high bit depth image. It's a you know raw FITS file. Uh, so the brightness values don't go from 0 to 255 like they would on a JPEG. They, they extend for 16 bits. Uh, so it's 255 times 255 for the maximum brightness value. The other factor is that it's compatible with the A07 and it has a secondary chip built into it for doing the guiding. So that star you see up in the top left wavering there, that is our guide star and it's conducting uh, guiding at a rate of 4 hertz, so it's making 4 corrections per second on that guide star trying to keep it centered using a tilt tip mirror system that can respond much faster than the motors of the telescope. So all of that um, allows for these images where you're imaging for a minute, you can image for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, and the stars will be nice sharp points uh, because you're compensating for any errors of the drives, you're compensating for any atmospheric uh, turbulence that might cause the image to shift a bit and blur the image. So you you get a lot of benefit out of doing that uh, that you just can't get out of a standard camera. Yes, I could get higher resolution images if I plugged my SLR into this, but the images actually wouldn't look as good because even though you might still be able to save raw files with high bit depth, sure, um, the camera is not actively cooled. It's not thermoelectrically cooled, so it's not holding an active set point temperature. And I also don't have the onboard guiding capability. Yes, I can auto guide with the refractor riding piggyback on top, but then you have to deal with flexure. It, there's a lot of other headaches you have to deal with when you're not doing on axis guiding. And I've had to deal with that before I've tried that that road, and that's a road to pain and suffering with this telescope, at least with the level of equipment I have. That's a road to pain and suffering, is what that is. Uh, you you know, if you have a really nice telescope, you can you can do that. Uh, but you better not have a cheap little refractor like what I've got with a plastic focusing tube, because as the telescope shifts, as it tracks across the sky, gravity causes that plastic focusing tube to bend even a fraction of a degree. That's going to throw off where it's pointing relative to the main telescope. Well, guess what? That means your guiding isn't working. That means your stars are smearing across your image. So, there's a lot of pitfalls that, on the surface, you wouldn't necessarily think of. You would think, oh, well, auto guiding is a silver bullet. That'll fix it for you, right? No, not, not always so easy. So, through years of experience and many, many false starts, I finally settled on this as a uh, relatively foolproof imaging setup for this telescope. With the SBIG ST2000XCM, the SBIG A07, I'm able to get images that, frankly, this level of telescope has no business getting. This is an 8-inch Alex Standard Classic on a Mead Standard Wedge and Mead Standard Tripod, roughly polar aligned tonight. I mean guys who've been doing this for years who work with much better equipment would say, well, that's going to be garbage. You're not going to be able to get anything decent out of that because you're going to have way too much periodic error. Uh, the mount's going to be too floppy. I mean, you're going to have all kinds of flexure issues. Well, this is how you cure all that. The A07. Uh, the on-axis guiding with the secondary guide ship on the uh, S-Big camera. The trade-off, of course, is you're working with a chip that's quite old and lower in resolution. Yet, you know, it's still what you'll find on the Mars Curiosity rover and, and Perseverance rovers. They use the exact same CCD chip, uh, the Kodak KAI 2020CM, something like that. Um, it's, the, it's the same CCD that you'll find in the panoramic camera of the Curio Curiosity rover and I think the Z-Cam on the 
Perseverance rover. Yes. Mind crime gets it right. Stabilization precision is greater than resolution frame quality on such faraway objects. Yes, it is. That's exactly right. I will take stability and precision and excellent guiding over increased resolution any day of the week. Increased resolution is meaningless if your images are all smeared because you're not guiding correctly or um, you're having flexure issues. And at the end of the day, I mean, even with a, a 1600 by 1200 CCD camera, you can still make a nice 1080p sort of uh, uh, video out of it. Now, it won't be 169 aspect ratio, it's a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, so you'll have, you know, black bars on either side, but still, it looks decent. It looks good. You can make a nice little time lapse here from tonight's images of the James Webb Space Telescope traveling through space. I mean, that's pretty cool. It's way better than what I used to get when I was starting out with a me DSI imager trying to do this with a, a basic entry level deep space imager. And then I tried an SLR for a while and I had to reject half the frames. You had to throw half the frames away because the guiding wasn't quite right or there was no guiding in some cases. It was just, well, hope the periodic error is not too bad in this frame. And that limited the maximum exposure length dramatically. And even with the limited exposure length, you still had to reject half the frames from a stacked image because half of them were smeared. And now you see consistent frames. What, what you notice here as you're watching with a good guide star running, and we're guiding it, you know, 4 hertz, the stars don't really change frame to frame. It all looks pretty much the same. The only thing moving, the only thing changing, is the James Webb Space Telescope from frame to frame. That's what you want to see, that kind of uh, consistency. And 333 from High Plains Drafter. Thumbs up. Thumbs way, way up. Great job. Thank you so much. And another three with a sticker from High Plains Drafter. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Go back here. See if I missed any super chats earlier. I think I've caught up now. And a four ninety nine from Phil Karras. Thank you so much. Seems like, okay, so a uh, question from Mind Crime here. Seems like the further op the object is away, uh, the further the object, sorry, seems like the further the object away is, the more exposure time you can get away with. Like, I can't do a one minute exposure on the street and see clear faces. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's some truth to that, depending on if the streaking of the object itself is a concern to you or not. Uh, for some people, it isn't necessarily as much of a concern. Like, they wouldn't mind running a 10, 20 minute exposure of JWST and have it, you know, streaking through a significant portion of the image in each frame. They'll, they'll just do fewer total frames over the course of the night, and it, it'll be a longer, more obvious streak in the image. Um, I, it's, I guess, sort of a, an aesthetic thing. Kind of like if you do a long exposure in a city and you get nice long streaks going down the street of all the car lights. That can be aesthetically pleasing, too, 
depends on what you're going for. Um, for me, I, I like a nice short streak, if, if any streaking at all, um, and capturing a high cadence of images uh, to produce a, a significant number of frames for a time lapse. Like we just collected our 60th frame just now of the, of the current pass, um, the current set of images that we've been running here for uh, this positioning of the telescope. So that, that'll look nice, you know, in a time lapse. My goal is to, to get as many as I can tonight, really. We get a nice clear night. It's cool. Um, you don't get a whole lot of nights like that on the weekends these days, it seems like, in Florida. So, um, definitely going to take advantage of it here. Uh, my Alex 200 is still on the original Mead fork mount. Uh, yeah. I mean, it does have the advantage of not having to do the equatorial mount uh, flip. But, you know, there are significant disadvantages of that as well with the tracking accuracy and all of that. And that, again, is why I am both limited by but also enjoying the A07 as a solution for all of that. Uh, the high cadence or the high tempo of corrections that it's able to make really helps compensate for the deficiencies of the mount. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that only works if you have a really bright guide star that you can guide with pretty short guide exposures. You know, I'm running 0.2 second guide exposures here. So you can't really get away with a, a dim guide star uh, to do that. But I can make that work most nights. I'm fine with that limitation for the, for the amount that I have invested in this machine. Uh, that's a... That's a decent trade-off. I'll take it. I'm not controlling the JWST. I'm controlling my telescope watching their telescope. <laughs> I'm controlling an, uh, an amateur telescope, an 8-inch Mead Alex 200, uh, that is imaging taking pictures of JWST, but I'm definitely not in control of JWST. I'm just watching. We're just spectating tonight. Somebody said, I think the reason for, uh, acroidia, acroid, 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 um, I think the reason for the Fermi, uh, I think the reason for the Fermi paradox is going to be so depressing. Uh, that's one I could dwell on for a long time. It's, uh, it's an interesting paradox, isn't it? And, uh, I've always been intrigued by the, I think they call it the dark forest hypothesis. The idea that, uh, we don't see aliens as far as we know uh, where are they why, why don't we hear them it's because the ones who speak up get eaten <laughs> maybe the possibility of you know if you're if you're an advanced alien civilization and you can send significant mass to other neighboring stars or even stars across the galaxy maybe the thought of an upstart is concerning enough that you just decide to exterminate all other intelligent life as soon as you find it and anyone who speaks up gets squashed immediately terrifying right <laughs> I mean I, I don't know if I believe that but it's an interesting thought thought experiment at least Yes, yes, that's a great quote there, Sean. Arthur C. Clarke said, We're either alone or we're not. Either prospect is terrifying. Man, that bunny's still hanging out behind me. I just hear him rustling around back there a little bit.
Yeah. Uh, Kaiser Cube says that uh, the degradation of information transmitted because of the inverse square lo law of light is uh, my speculation for why we don't hear them. I mean, it's true. It, not only is our bubble of radio signals not all that large yet, but even in, if you were at the edge of that bubble, you'd have trouble hearing us. Our transmission power is not that great, and the sun itself is pump, pumping out a lot of radio waves. So trying to hear that over the over the glare, not easy. Check on some stuff here. Sometimes it's a little hard for me to tell if the telescope's focus is shifted or not to a significant degree. I'm gonna pull up a uh, deep sky stacker and just do a little checking on things. Hopefully we're not in tough shape. I wouldn't want to be in tough shape. For one thing, we've got a really good guide star right now, and I really don't want to change that situation. I don't want to rock the boat by going to hunt down a focus star and then come back and not be able to find a decent guide star. There's that, there's that A07 limitation speaking up again. But I am going to just quickly check and compare the current images to some of the first images where I know things were in good focus and just see how much things have changed. What are we, you know, what are we dealing with here in terms of image quality? And... To some extent, because we have such a good guide star, I'm going to say, if it's well enough, I'll leave well enough alone. I mean, in just tabbing back and forth between the, st the start of this run to the current image, I don't notice any significant degradation in focus. Just within the run. Now, if I go back to the very start... I'd still say it's not... It's not changed much at all. Technically, could it use a little tweak? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it... it it could probably use a small tweak, but it's not so bloody obvious that, like, you're, you know, you're your own worst critic, and I know what to look for, but if you didn't know what to look for, I don't think you'd notice. I, I'm, I'm saying that's well enough. I'm going to leave it. Better to leave it, I think, and just complete the run. Just keep tracking J, JWST. Just keep taking images of it. So that at the end of it, you know, you have a nice long run of images of it crossing, basically crossing the field of view. I think that's the goal. So, we're going to stay with it. We're just going to stay with it. Oh, that's a great question, Charlie. So, am I guiding off a star in this image, or do I have a separate guide camera? 
it's the same camera, but it's also not a star in this image. It's a star that's uh, above the image. The guide camera is above the main imaging chip, and so it's not in the field of view of the main imaging chip, but it's a piece, it's using a little, like a miniature periscope, basically, to pick off a piece of light that is just above the main image, and it goes to a, a guide chip offset from the main chip, and that's a totally separate image, but it's through the same camera, so it's looking through the telescope, it's looking through the same telescope, not a separate guide telescope, and so anything that happens with the main telescope is reflected in the auto guide image, and so it's compensating for that uh, four times a second. Yeah, Kaiser Cube, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's where I'm at right now. Yes, could it be a tiny bit sharper? Yeah, probably, if I, if I went off to another star to refocus and then came back and started a new run on JWST. But it's really not broken. I don't really want to fix it, um, because then I'll have to go find a new guide star, and it probably won't be this bright. Uh, it's running real good right now. I'm just going to keep keep shooting it. And what will be, will be. It hit that star. Yeah, it's going to, isn't it? Yeah, it's basically obscuring that star. That's cool. What is the name of the software I'm using to track? So I'm just, basically, I'm just manually putting in the coordinates o over time occasionally and having the telescope update to the new position. The software used for imaging is CCD Soft. $20 from um, Cyritis. Cyritis? Uh, I'm off to watch a Christmas movie with my family, Die Hard. <laughs> it's a great Christmas movie. So I hope to see you with Everyday Astronaut again. Happy holidays. Thank you very much. Telescope occultation, yes. Telescope occulting a star seen by another telescope. It's a bit meta, isn't it? Guiding's starting to bounce around a little bit. I don't know if we're getting some, we're getting some high altitude haze, a little bit. I think after I'm tempted after this image to decrease the guiding speed a little bit to compensate, and get some brighter images. I think it's having trouble finding the center of the guide star a little bit. Seems like it's maybe bouncing around a little more than I'd like. And I might be able to compensate for that. Okay, auto guide stop. I'm going to go to 0.3 seconds. Auto guide, auto guide go. And start images. Okay, just a brief interruption there in imaging to try to increase the signal on that star for guiding. We're now guiding at 3 hertz instead of 4, but should still be good enough. So, let's see. Just so I keep it straight, let me double check how many. How many images we were able to collect on that last run? Because we've now reset the counter on the uh, the imaging panel there. So 
So it looks like 72 is the number. So 72 images on that last run. And like I said, we've now reset the counter, but uh, that's okay. member of the near cam team here to say hi absolutely love what you're doing please keep the phenomenal work thank you so much Raphael. appreciate it glad you could join us glad you get to see uh, a view here of your own uh, telescope cursor down. JWST has obviously moved down a little bit in the last few minutes. Yeah, just looking at the sky condition, I don't see any concerns haze-wise or anything. Not sure why, but it seemed like the guide star got a little bit dimmer over time or What not? I would say maybe atmospheric extinction, but honestly, we're close to the zenith right now. What does JWST stand for? James Webb Space Telescope. Does Florida have any low-light designated areas? Sort of. Um, Chiefland Astronomy Village is definitely a place which has some strict rules on lighting within the village. But technically speaking, I mean, the broader area there does not necessarily have anything preventing uh, the buildup of light pollution over time. Definitely things have, I'd say, the quality there of the, of the darkness has deteriorated, unfortunately, over the last couple decades that I've been out there. And we have a new member. Norman Reitzel. Thank you very much for joining. Appreciate your support. How bright is it now? It's about magnitude 12. I'm just guesstimating based on the brightness of neighboring stars. Uh, but no, that is not bright enough to see by eye or even really with binoculars, I'd say. You really do need a telescope to see that. However, that is bright enough to see through the telescope. I'd say if I had an eyepiece in there, I could see it with uh, this 8-inch telescope. Thank you, Norman. Appreciate it. Yeah, about uh, six months till fully operational, really. Commissioning phase. So, we have a member from the near cam team here. I, I don't want to speak out of turn. He, he could give a better description of why it takes six months, but my understanding is that is uh, driven by a desire to gradually lower the temperature of the instruments, gradually align the mirrors, and uh, make sure everything is set properly.
what field of view is the image? Well, we're zoomed in here. The total field of view of the image, to give you some idea, will just barely fit the full moon from side to side, horizontally. So it's about half a degree with the field of view. Uh, but as you can see, we're zooming in a bit to get closer in on JWST. I couldn't tell you exactly what we're looking at here at this magnification. But probably... Mm, maybe a quarter of a degree. Maybe a bit more than that. Thank you so much, TA0 software. Tau software, I guess. So yeah, it will jump from frame to frame a bit. Uh, these are one minute exposures, so it takes a while to get the next picture down and see where the telescope has moved to in the next frame. Man, that guide star is really getting... I think it's just the seeing. I think it's just the atmospheric seeing is so turbulent. I think that's what it is. It might actually be better off increasing the guiding rate a little bit back to point two. I'm, I'm going to leave it for now. Yeah, the stars are definitely getting bigger now. I think the focus is going out quite a bit in the last few minutes. So I think at this point we're better off going ahead and doing a refocus on Rigel. So after this frame we'll do that. As much as I don't want to lose this guide star, it's, it's time to... Uh, it's no longer well enough is what it is, and I think that's driving some of the guiding struggles, the loss of focus. It's probably driving the dimming of the, of the guide star as well. So we'll stop that. So we'll take a break here on imaging JWST for a bit to do some refocus work. So we're going to move it over to Rigel and uh, refocus.
So the way we do this is we put a Batonov mask on here. And this is going to create this uh, diffraction pattern in the star. You can see it there. And there's Rigel. And we want to get the the pattern perfectly symmetrical as much as possible. So the center spike should be running directly through the middle of the other two. And you can see it's a, just a little off. It's actually not as much as I thought it would be. I thought it would be much worse than that, to be honest. But it could use a little tweak, just a bit. Okay, I don't know if that's the right direction or the wrong direction. Might be the wrong one. No? That might have been a good move. Uh, give it a little more. I'm just making tiny adjustments. Yeah. I think that's looking better. Yeah, that's pretty much right through the middle. And it's looking good there. Okay, we'll call that good. Subframe. Put that back to one minute. Okay, so I'll slew back to JWST now. So we are 4.40 universal time. should do it. Question is, am I going to find a guide star? Ooh, I am. Ooh, that's a good looking guide star. So we can take that down probably to point one and still be good. Ooh, no, no, no. No, no, no. We did not do good. Okay. Try point two. I might have gotten too uh, too eager there. You know, even point two is a little too eager. Point three. It's better. Still kind of a blob. Must be a double star. 
It's not great. Yeah. It's not a great situation there, is it? What seemed like a good idea at first turns out to be a terrible idea. Well, we can play a game called Hunt in the Dark and maybe get lucky. I don't know. Maybe repositioning in the image will give better results. I don't know. Really not. The problem is this bloody thing is just a gigantic blob because I think there's actually a tight double there that's not well separated, and that's mm, not an ideal situation when you're looking for a single single center point of brightness in the software. Eh, we'll give it a shot. We'll see how it goes. We'll just try it. What's the harm, right? So, one minute exposure. Uh, let me double check something real quick. Just so I don't do something silly and lose the frames. I've done that to myself before. Nope, we're good. Okay. JCIMS says, I just spent the past five minutes looking, and this is the only channel I could find even attempting to look for it. Well, thanks. Uh, and thank you for joining as a member. So we'll have it here in just a second. Um, if you just joined, we're just getting done refocusing the telescope. And we've been tracking it all night uh, since I started webcasting it at 9 Eastern. So we just did a little, little bit of refocus work. I'm not entirely sure I'm happy with the guide star I've got to work with right now. It's not the best. <laughs> it's barely suitable. It's actually a double star and it's making hell for the software trying to auto-guide. But JWST, if, if I'm seeing it right, is visible right there. So, we've got it. So, we'll take a dark frame, get those hot pixels out of here. That's better. Yeah, so basically we're we're getting along with a barely suitable dark or a barely suitable um, double star of a guide star. It's a from what I can tell, it looks like a poorly separated uh, double star where they're kind of merged together into one big blob. 
and I just refocused the telescope, so I know it's not the focus, it's just the guide star itself is ugly, and the software is struggling to keep a lock on the center of it, because it's like, well, there's two centers here, what do you want me to point at? It's not expecting that. But I don't feel like fishing in the dark for another guide star. So you can see J, uh, James Webb just moved there between the last frame and the current frame. Extra movement because it took a one minute dark frame between the two. Oh, thank you, Lexington Felix. Glad to do this. Bad seeing? Yeah, there's some of that, too. The adaptive optics are trying to help with that, but the bigger issue right now is the guide star itself is itself a double star, and that's just not... that's just not kosher for what we're trying to do here. But I'm trying to make do with it. Uh, looks like I missed from... Uh, a $5 super chat from Too Crazy for you all. Will you be posting a video from all the images? If so, where? Yes, I will. I'll be posting a time lapse. Um, that'll go probably on this channel and certainly on my Twitter at Astroferg. Um, but certainly, I, I expect I'll be posting on this channel as well. So if you subscribe, you can come back and uh, I'll have a time lapse up sometime tomorrow. Heck, if you stay to the end of the webcast, I've got software that auto processes the time lapses now. So, you might get a special surprise at the very end. I'll uh, see if I can fire that up and uh, process the time lapse. In fact, uh, if you give me a minute here, I'll be back in a few minutes and uh, we'll do a quick run of a time lapse from the, uh, from the frames collected earlier on the last run for the last hour or so and uh, see what that looks like. So, I'll be back in a minute.
Alright, I'm back, and I have a time-lapse of the previous hour and 20 minute run that we did before we refocused and moved the telescope. So I'm going to load that up now. Files. So I have two versions of it. Uh, one where you get a little bit of variation in brightness, which creates kind of a flashing effect a bit uh, from not controlling for um, just, I don't know, transients in the camera, haze, whatever. Uh, any haze will reflect more light pollution back to the telescope uh, and alter the overall brightness of the image and that kind of thing. So this is what that looks like. This is just uh, tone mapped. And again, this is a time lapse of the previous hour and 20 minute run that we did. Notice, James Webb Space Telescope is not actually traveling in a straight line in this image. If you look closely, it actually curves a bit. You want to know why that is? Well, that is really because of topocentric parallax from the Earth's rotation. So, Earth is rotating as we're taking these images, and that's altering our position relative to James Webb Space Telescope as it heads into deep space. It actually shifts the shifts the the uh, trajectory, the apparent trajectory of it a bit, and tends to create an apparent curve in things that are traveling in more or less a straight line into deep space. Not really a straight line. It's traveling in its own. Um, We can call it a conic section, if as it were. But despite that, what the curve you're seeing really is is, is driven tends to be driven by um, Earth's rotation, causing parallax over the course of an hour or two of imaging. So you can actually see that here, which is really cool. You only tend to see that in objects that are rel still pretty darn close to Earth. You know, at half a distance to the Moon or more, or more or less. Uh, in that kind of range, you tend to see that. Um, as it gets further and further out, once it gets past the moon, you may not see that as much. Um, it'll be interesting to see, though, once it gets to L2, how long do you have to monitor it before you notice a curve in its apparent position in the sky just from it orbiting the L2 point. And in the last few frames before it resets, if you watch all the brightest stars, you can start to see them get a little bit bigger as the focus starts to shift. As the telescope's position is changing, as it's tracking the sky, the force of gravity increases or decreases on the mirror, and that causes a shift in the mirror's position, because that's how it actually is focused, is by shifting the mirror. And so, uh, unfortunately, gravity can cause the mirror to flop around a little bit, and that... Uh, that causes the focus point to shift a bit over the course of long ex uh, long exposure runs. So that's why I took it offline at that point and went back to Rigel to refocus, and then we came back to JWST. So that is that video. I'm now going to load up the other one, uh, the other version of that. And in this one, I'm controlling for the median point of the image. It blows out the image more because I'm basically straight converting it down to an 8-bit image. I'm not tone mapping it properly. These images, again, are high bit depth images. The brightness range ranges from 0 to 255 times 255. It's 16-bit, it's not 8-bit. But I'm just taking an 8-bit section of that histogram, uh, a range from 0 to 255, out of the part of it where the median median is located in the image, and so that tends to compensate for transient fluctuations in the median brightness of the image. Um, but it blows it out, so you can see here the the stars are overexposed a bit, um, and you see more of the of the grain of the Im the graininess of the noise of the image because we're we're um, not really properly tone mapping here. Uh, but it also doesn't have the flashing effect, so there's that. And you can see the other brief little streaks shoot through. Those are other satellites like we talked about. 
uh, tend to be geosynchronous or close to geosynchronous satellites near the Clark Belt, near the geostationary band. And so there it goes. There goes JWST in deep space over the last hour and 20 minutes or so. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to shrink that down and have that in a corner somewhere, like here maybe, while we also look at the live image. So we have the live image of JWST, and we also have the time lapse over the last uh, hour, 20 minutes or so from the previous run that you guys were watching. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm pretty darn happy with that. And yes, this is really a live feed. On, on the right and, and kind of behind the video, what you're seeing is the live image from the telescope. And then in the sub window, you have the time lapse over an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, I kind of do like the second one better as well, Kaiser Cube, even though it's a little more blown out. You don't have fluctuation in the brightness. And I think aesthetically that leads to a more pleasing image. I'll try to work on tuning up that software. I wrote, I wrote the code to do that, to do this sort of automatic processing of the FITS files. I love it because I don't have to sit there trying to manually process each one, you know, with 80 images in a, in a, in a run of time lapse. Um, it just handles it all very quickly, automatically. So I'll try to tune that up a bit and see if I can basically condense a wider portion of the histogram down to the 8-bit image, and I think that will help with the quality of it. Where in relation to the Earth and Moon is it? Uh, last I checked, it was about 40% the distance to the Moon. We'll do a quick check here and see if I can get the current distance. My phone battery is almost dead at this point. Um, that's what I've been using to get the coordinates out of JPL. So we are now 5.08 universal time. So it's a little more distant now. Let's see what we've got here. Hundred and sixty six thousand two hundred forty eight kilometers is the current distance. What code did I use for the program? Python. This is this is all Python. I think I used a little bit of OpenCV, but also mostly NumPy, uh, because I'm working with high bit depth images here. OpenCV tends to work better with 8 bit images. It's not brilliant for working with high bit depth files. So I just load it as a NumPy array and do my do my uh, most of my work there with that in terms of finding the median of the image and then uh, grabbing just that part of the histogram where the median of the image is in the median of a range from 0 to 255 and exclude everything else. That's, that's basically all there is to it. And then you convert that down to an 8-bit image and save it using OpenCV into a video. Would have been easier to use MATLAB? I guess, if I knew MATLAB. I don't know. I've never never played with MATLAB. I'm a Python guy all the way. Python 3, yeah. So the video you're seeing consists of 80 frames, one minute exposures each. So every frame you're seeing in that time lapse is one minute uh, over a period of 80 minutes. So the, the picture behind is a still picture. It's a one minute exposure. Uh, where I have JWST pointing at wh where its current position is. That's a live image, but that's a one-minute exposure with the deep space camera. And these will all get turned into time-lapse videos.
Okay, so let me catch up on supers that I missed. Uh, looks like I missed one from... Uh, su Boy, I'm going to butcher this. I'm sorry. Chatterjee. <laughs> su Turtha? Su Turtha. Chatterjee. Uh, difference between JWST and Hubble Telescope. Well, the primary difference... Um, well, there's a lot of big differences there. One of the most obvious is that Hubble is primarily designed to work within the visual spectrum, but it also can dip into UV and near-infrared. James Webb Space Telescope is more dedicated for infrared observations. That's why its mirror is gold, uh, gold-coated. And, uh, of course, the other big difference is a much bigger telescope with a segmented mirror uh, that was folded up and will be deployed and, extent and uh, come together and then aligned to produce a total mirror size that's much larger than Hubble. So the total uh, diameter of uh, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope will be about six and a half meters. And let's see, Hubble was what? What was Hubble? I can never remember off the top of my head. 2.4 meters. Yeah, I should have remembered that. Okay, yeah, I'll drop a link to my GitHub here in the chat for anyone who wants to download my software. I don't think I've put... Oh gosh, I should do that. I don't think I've put my uh, my automatic sort of uh, time lapse maker up yet. I haven't really put it into a user friendly form. It's just a Python script, and I just edit the code as needed for each time lapse. Sometimes I have to tweak it a bit. So I feel like it's not really ready for prime time for public use yet because you want something that's you know user friendly and may have settings and options, but is relatively straightforward to to edit those options not without having to go in and edit bits of code so I haven't really polished the rough edges on that yet um, but yeah I, I do need to do that because I mean, it's quite handy it's quite handy to be able to just throw a bunch of fits files at it and boom there's your time lapse it's nice what would I personally spend JWST observing time on well see this is why this is why they don't ask me this is why this is why I don't have JWST uh, James Webb Space Telescope observing time because I would spend it on something stupid, frivolous, pointless, with no good scientific justification whatsoever, just because I'm a nerd <laughs> and and I enjoy pointing my telescope at pointless goose chases that I know are wild goose chases just to make con not just to make content but because I find it entertaining to literally entertain some of these conspiracy theories sometimes it's something I shouldn't even bother with but I can't help it sometimes I just I just enjoy a good hunt for a fake Nibiru or Planet X whatever Planet X I mean there are real theories about a potential you know planet out there yet to be discovered but I'm talking about the sensationalized end-of-the-world conspiracy claims that claim that a winged planet is coming towards Earth. And so, for example, sometimes on, say, Google Earth or uh, Google Space... What do you call it? Google, Google Sky. Uh, whatever it's called. The, the Google Sky version of Google Earth, where you can view the sky. People will find something they think is Nibiru. It's the end of the world. It's some winged planet coming at us. For some reason, it's got wings. So, they'll find some some star out there that has an associated reflection nebula that looks like wings coming off the star. And the most one of the most popular um, examples of that is a reflection nebula known as GN05.39.2. And it's a T-Tari type star. It's an interesting star on its, in its own right. It's a young pre-main sequence star, I believe, a uh, Titari type star, with an associated reflection nebula that is essentially 
I guess you call it a reflection nebula, but it's it's really coming from. Uh, um, my understanding is it's coming from the star itself, from material coming off jets off the poles of the star that are kind of getting blown back by interstellar wind, and it creates the appearance of wings coming off the star. And it looks really interesting on Google Sky, and so people latched onto that and said, oh, oh, this is Nibiru. Some even extended the myth to say that, oh, they previously were hiding this on Google Sky, and then they opened it up and we saw what it was, and it was, you know, a winged star, whatever. No, it wasn't ever hidden on Google Sky, but that's beside the point. There's a whole mythology that now surrounds this otherwise ordinary Titari star. Uh, and last I checked, Hubble still had not taken a picture of it. I would love to use JWST to take a picture of this thing, uh, just for the heck of it. And you know, furthermore, if you could get it at the right time where it's, and I don't, I don't know that, uh, actually I'm pretty sure JWST's, like, uh, pointing limits would not allow for it, but it would be cool if you could get it where, um, the distance to JWST forms a nice baseline to measure parallax and just establish, look, guys, this is not in our solar system. It's nowhere near our solar system. It's another star. That'd be cool, but Again, they, A, wouldn't let me point JWST probably that close to the sun. Well, maybe you could. Maybe you could within the limits of pointing because you've got the sun shield, you know, blocking the sun, so you, you have to you have to be strategic, right, in how you point the thing. You can't just point it willy-nilly any direction at any time. But if you could maximize the distance to the James Webb to serve as a baseline for a crude parallax measurement, even with just a million miles, a million and a half kilometers, it's not a huge baseline for parallax when it comes to other stars. But it's enough to at least establish very definitively that, hey, this ain't local. This is not in our solar system, right? Um, I think that would be fun. <laughs> but, see, that's why they wouldn't let me do it. My justification is terrible. But at least I'm self-aware of that, right? I am aware of this. Thank you, Electra. I'm not genius. I, at least I don't think I am. But I have, you know, occasionally made some some actual contributions in some way, like a uh, sat tracker. <laughs> People would just call it fake if I did. Yeah, they probably would, but who cares? I enjoy doing it for the fi for the sake of it anyway. Like one of my favorite moments in amateur astronomy was actually when I took a picture of Wolf three five nine, which is a relatively nearby star. Star Trek fans know it as the Battle of Wolf 359, right? Where the Borg destroyed uh, 39 Federation starships, whatever. Um, but the New Horizons probe pointed at Wolf 359 for a fun little science project demonstration, essentially a public outreach opportunity, where if you took a picture of Wolf 359, they told you ahead of time, hey, we're going to take a picture of, of these stars, of some close-by stars, including Wolf 359, uh, and here's when to take a picture so that you can receive light that left the star at the exact same time as the light uh, that we're going to capture with New Horizons. And so that's what I did. I set up the scope and from my driveway, took a picture of Wolf 359 at the exact same moment, uh, capturing light that left the star at the exact same moment that the light also arrived late, uh, at a different, slightly different time on Earth time, but light that had traveled the same amount of time from the star to uh, the New Horizons probe. And so that simultaneous observation in light time allowed us to measure the distance to Wolf 359 using simultaneous observations, not using... Uh, parallax where you have to take a picture of a star and then wait six months to take a picture of the same star when Earth's on the opposite side of the sun. No, instead, 
These are simultaneous observations taken at one moment in time uh, to get an instantaneous reading on the star's distance, which is something you can't normally do, do unless you've got a spacecraft way out there like New Horizons. So to me, that was really cool to be able to do it that way um, and to be able to actually measure the distance. And sure enough, it came out to the right figure. Uh, so that, that was really cool. Of course, you know, conspiracy theorists, flat earthers and space deniers and the like all say it's fake anyway. Of course, they were going to always say that, but that's not the point. The point is, it was fun. Uh, so a $5 super chat from Sebastian Boltz. You think they will point it at Tabby's star? That's a great question. Yeah, I bet they will. Uh, that's, a, that's a worthwhile use of JWST time. Uh, Tabby's star, some thought initially that it might be proof of aliens, that it might be a sign of a Dyson sphere or Dyson sphere forming or Dyson swarm where the star appeared to be getting much, much dimmer at odd intervals with an odd light curve shape that might suggest some sort of artificial object around it. But more recently, I believe the, the leading hypothesis is that it's uh, natural occurring dust blocking the star at times and in, with you know unusual shapes that we didn't expect in terms of the light curve, the way the light dips. It didn't look symmetrical and clean the way it would if it were a planet, right? Um, it, it had unusual characteristics. So, certainly, uh, because James Webb is observing in infrared, that might tell us more information, because uh, some wavelengths of infrared allow you to peer through certain amounts of dust and, and uh, gas. Uh, so, yeah, that might be, that might be some, something useful to do with it, unlike what I suggested. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I am fully aware my suggestion is pointless. But that's not why I suggested it. <laughs> I mean, you did ask me what I would do with it personally, right? Okay, another $5 super chat from March Rom. What do I think? What do you think what the most groundbreaking initial discovery will be? And how soon do you think we'll have that information? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. And probably beyond my expertise to accurately speculate... There are so many unknown unknowns out there that I couldn't really say, but certainly Hubble revolutionized astronomy, especially when it came to dark energy and universal expansion and change in the rates of universal expansion. I expect Webb might do the same. It might add another layer that we didn't expect on that story, uh, and that discovery m maybe might happen um, sooner rather than later after it's commissioned. So, we'll see how it goes. Awestruck for $5. What the heck is that thing moving at supersonic speed on the looped video? That is James Webb Space Telescope. That is an hour and 20 of footage. That is an hour and 20 minutes of footage looped. And uh, each frame is a one minute exposure. And that is where we saw it earlier in this webcast. These were images acquired earlier in this webcast that I'm now playing back uh, from a previous run of images where we were collecting frames uh, before we went off and refocused the telescope. So I'm just checking on things now. Just looking around, seeing how we're doing here. So we've had 35 frames on this run. Not nearly as many yet, but uh, just uh, trying to get an idea, gauge where we're at with things. Let's see. Yeah, the telescope's kind of not doing as good on the guiding. And again, that's it's really because of this stupid double star nonsense I'm dealing with right now. Oh, okay. I guess I should just bite the bullet and hunt for a better 
Guide Star. We've only burned 35 minutes right now. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. Yeah. That, that image is blurred a little bit, too. Which I'm not happy about, to be honest. I, I don't accept that as the best it can do. It can do better. I know it can do better. The main thing right now is... hunt for a better guide star. So, one option right off the bat is to just recenter and start a new run. I think that's not a bad idea. So we'll recenter on the current coordinates of James Webb. So give me a second here. We're at 527 now, universal time. So I'm gonna pull the coordinates and see what we can do. <clears throat> Okay, so, give ourselves a new uh, new field of view to look at with the auto guider, and we'll see what we see. It's a risk, though. It's definitely a gamble. And the gamble did not pay off at all. There are no guide stars now. Okay, so, basically we're just going to go hunting and see if we can find something. To be clear, I don't necessarily like having to do it this way, but at the moment I do not have my fields of view set up in Sky Safari Pro like I should to be able to predict where the guide stars are going to be, where the good guide stars are. I'm just hunting in the dark, which is not smart. The other thing I may have to break down and do is go get my phone charger, because my phone is very near death. It's knocking on death's door, and, uh... Hmm. Let's see. I'm just guessing. I'm just guessing. We have a guide star there, but, okay, so, I'll turn off my marker for JWST, because that definitely doesn't apply right now, until I find it again, but I'm not really looking for it at the moment, what I'm looking for is a guide star, mm. so, do is get a fresh mark of our current position and I'm going to try to force fit a solution here in terms of the oops okay that's not enough give me more give me 15 seconds on that Yeah, that's what I'm looking at there. Okay. Eesh. Okay. So, I can tell... <sighs> yeah. Dagnabbit. My best bet... is to shift it to the right. 
so we're just gonna keep moving to the right and hope we run into one of these stars I'm seeing that kind of would work okay can I do this I don't know if I can do this I guess I can do this Keep taking images with the main imager while I'm also taking images with the guider, which you can't really tell because it's hiding behind the uh, hiding behind the video window. But just bear with me a minute. I'm ooh, the heck was that? Something bright streaking through. What you doing? You guys see that on the webcast there? That little zigzag thing. What the heck is that? It's probably a satellite passing through something other than James Webb, moving much quicker than James Webb. It's probably going to be gone in the next frame. Yeah, it's gone. So I'm going to try to reposition the frame to maximize my chances of picking up a guide star and hope, and just basically hope, that at the end of that process that I still have James Webb somewhere in the field of view. Maybe not in the ideal spot, but somewhere in the field of view. Like I say, it's a gamble. Okay, we have a star. I don't know if it's really the one I was hoping for, looking for. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to pull some stuff here. Gosh, it's really not, really not what I wanted. Okay. I may have to live with a suboptimal guide star again, but just one that's not a double star would be a, a nice start. Okay. Well, I'm back to that one that I was looking at a moment ago that 
I thought, well, it's not great, but maybe it'll do. Alright, let's see what this even looks like. I don't know. It's probably awful. Yeah, it's pretty awful. That's, that's downright horrific. Okay, well, what I can do in the meantime, just do another focus run on Rigel, just to make sure we're still good on that. We had some initial luck earlier in the night with just fortuitously placed guide stars, but eventually your luck runs out when you're just flying blind and hoping you land on a guide star. I'm probably not explaining the whole process very well, but to give you some idea, um, the guide chip is much, much smaller than the main imaging chip, so it's looking at a much smaller piece of the sky. And consequently, statistically speaking, your odds of getting a bright star in that tiny piece of sky any random place you happen to go and point the telescope is pretty low. It's not impossible, but it's just statistically speaking less likely. And basically I've just been getting lucky on those odds. Yeah, Rigel needs a needs a little focusing tweak here. But my luck has kind of run out on this latest field of view, so we'll refocus on Rigel and then once again recenter on James Webb and roll the dice again and see if we can get something going. So the focus needed tweaking again anyway. That's how it goes as the James Webb is now getting lower in the sky gradually over the course of time, course of the evening. So, gravity is now going to shift the mirror to a different position. We have to fight that by uh, occasionally refocusing which is what I'm doing right now with the Batonov mask, trying to get these diffraction spikes symmetrical, like that, where the, cin the center spike is running right through the X formed by the other two. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, now we go back to James Webb.
So, we are now positioned hopefully back on James Webb somewhere in the universe. First order of business. Let's see what the guides... Ooh, okay. We have a star in the guide camera. Hooray, that's a nice change of pace from the last few minutes. So, let's give that a 0.6. Nope, 0.6. Auto-guide that thing and see what happens. Okay, that's nice and bright at 0.6. We can give it. We can give it some more. We can give it down. That down to point two, maybe. It's there, but it's, it's not brilliant at point two. Point three might be a better compromise. Yeah, that's a better compromise. Okay, auto save is on. Okay, so show the camera control again. Auto guider running. Let's take an image. So now we'll start taking pictures of James Webb once again. Or so we hope. Right? So, apologies for all that detour there. We just refocused the telescope, repositioned back on James Webb, got a new guide star, and now we're taking a one-minute exposure to capture a fresh image of James Webb Space Telescope. So, we have our new image. Looks like I see where James Webb is in the frame. It's up at the top. So I suspect it's right here. It's taking a dark frame right now to get rid of all these colorful pixels. Those are hot pixels. They'll be calibrated out by the dark frame in just uh, about 30 seconds. But uh, I believe that's going to be James Webb right there. And we'll see if it moves in the next frame. And then for those of you just joining us in the smaller window in the bottom left corner, that is a time lapse of frames of the James Webb Space Telescope. You can see moving there through the frame uh, over the course of about an hour and 20 minutes. Every single frame is a one minute exposure and that was recorded earlier this evening during the webcast. So we're starting a new sequence of frames now with uh, the telescope refocused and repositioned. Hope that brings everyone up to speed on what we're doing here. Yes, we see the James Webb Telescope in a telescope. My telescope here. Uh, this telescope's in Florida. This is an 8-inch Mead LX200 Classic with an S-Big ST2000XCM single-shot color camera. This is true color. And an S-Big A07 Adaptive Optics Unit currently trying to guide at uh, 3 hertz. this down a bit. Well, 
really what I want to do is I want to... Oh, come on. Guide star window up. It will let me. Thank you. That's what I want. I want you up here. Come on. Okay. Move that over here. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. So oh, there we go. Here's the current position of James Webb. So basically on the right you have the live image from the telescope. And the top, uh, very top of the uh, window in the background you can see the star uh, twinkling there. That's a guide star that we're guiding on it. 3 hertz uh, with the adaptive optics unit to compensate for atmosphere as well as any uh, tracking inaccuracies. And then uh, in the foreground in the bottom left you have the time lapse from the hour and 20 minutes of frames that we collected earlier in the evening. So hopefully we can start a new sequence here of frames to get another time lapse sequence going in a new field of view. So you can see there, the new frame just came in, and you can see how James Webb is the only thing moving there. That's what the overall field of view of this frame looks like. Got a pretty nice blue star there, and uh, a whiter, sort of yellowish star in frame two on this one. It's pretty nice. I like it. Oh, I think I see somebody asking about my GitHub again. Uh, I haven't put the code for the time-lapse software on GitHub yet, but I should. I need to clean it up more to make it more user-friendly, make it more um, extensible, I guess, or uh, applicable to a wider range of hardware. It's really tailored right now for my camera, my telescope, and, and the settings that I typically use. But um, certainly I should, I want to release it. I just have to clean it up a bit so that the user can specify things like, okay, what do you want the resolution to be? Well, in my case, I know what the resolution of my camera is, and I just want it to be the native resolution of the camera. But some other people with higher megapixel cameras may not want that. They may want to uh, scale it down for the, for the initial video on the time lapse or, you know, take a subframe of the total frame or something. Things like that, I, I would like to add more features to it. I can think of a lot of things I would like to do for it. I just don't have the time to code everything. Oh, thank you, Kaiser Cube. I'm glad you posted my GitHub link there. Just add arg parsing. I mean, that's one thing, Andrew. Like, yeah, arg parsing is easy enough to add, but I'm thinking along the lines of, like, a GUI with the ability to point and click and drag and select a subframe that you want to zoom in on and just do a time lapse of that. You know, it, it could really do with a whole GUI interface, a Tekinter or something. And I could add that, but it's just time. It's just a question of priorities and time. So, you know, maybe a simple arg par solution is the answer where you specify the top left, bottom right corner, etc., etc. But then that gets to be a bit ugly, where you're specifying this huge long string in, in a command prompt interface. It's not the most user-friendly way of doing things. 
I just, I like it right now because it's dead simple. There are no arguments I specify. I just feed it a directory filled with the FITS files, and boom, out pops the video, you know, a minute or two later. It's not the taking, it's not automating the taking of the pictures. That's all done by CCD soft. It's just automating the processing of the FITS files down to, an, from a, you know, the 16-bit FITS files down to an 8-bit video in some semi-intelligent way where it's at least taking the median of the images and it's compensating for any variations in the median brightness of the image which tends to happen with this camera so it makes for a nicer looking uh, video in the end oh no 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 I didn't design CCD soft <laughs> no no the software controlling the camera was not my design Oh, and we had a $10 super chat from Curtis Horn. Thank you very much. Could that be a course correction JWST just did? It was supposed to do one 15 hours after launch. Uh, no, the uh, well, the curving is actually due to uh, the rotation of the Earth. Um, the initial, there was like an initial spot where it was like brighter in a frame at the very beginning of the webcast. And I do wonder if that's related to maybe an attitude change after the course correction. Uh, also, are you going to try to do again after the sun shield is deployed in two days? Yeah, you bet. If the weather's good and I have time, definitely, definitely would like to do that. And a huge super chat. Wow. Thank you so much for $150 from Harish Prasanna. Thank you so much for James Webb and your noble pursuits. Appreciate it. Thank you for your support. That was very generous of you. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Appreciate it. Wow. Jeez. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, thank you. Oof. Oof did. Is the white dot in the top left corner... Uh, top left just moving in real time. Yeah, that's in real time. That's a guide star that it's uh, uh, tracking. So the guide camera is a separate imager within the, C within the CCD camera that picks off a piece of the light uh, just off the axis of the main camera and it uh, guides on that. But it's looking through the same telescope so um, it doesn't have to worry about flexure or some of the other pitfalls that you have to worry about when using an off-axis uh, or a uh, piggybacked auto-guide telescope. What is that light thingy on the left side of the screen? So that is the guide star, the pixelated... Uh, light thingy on the left side of the screen. Yeah, uh, so uh, no, no problem there, Mercer. So in Unix, they used a tool, used a tool called Image Magic. I'm familiar with Image Magic. Uh, I think. Oh no, I'm thinking Image J. Sorry, to do transmog batch image processing from command line, but I'm not familiar with the format you're working with. Yeah, there probably are existing tools to do command line batch processing. Um, it's like, it was at the point where I didn't have anything handy for that, and it was just easier to code it myself in a few minutes. I mean, it literally just took me a few minutes to code it, because um, it's kind of dead simple right now. But it seems like something that maybe would be useful to others who also are, find themselves in the same spot. Um, so I would like to clean it up and brush, polish the edges a bit and put it out there just so others can use it. Thingy is the official term, too. I mean, maybe that's just what I'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> and two pounds, or two, yeah, it's pounds, right? Two pounds from uh, SlickX666 for a shot in memory of B. I assume that's for Bool. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You always, I always 
I'm going to be thinking about bull this time of year for sure. Um, to the great, the late, great bullionator. And uh, 19 from Minaj uh, Maria. Thank you very much. And a <laughs> silly, uh, smiley sticker. Image magic is horrendously <laughs> complexificated to use. Uh, Hi-Fi 1970, will we ever see naked eye visible flares off JWST once the Sun Shield, uh, off the Sun Shield once it's parked? I don't know. I don't suspect so, but uh, it should be bright enough at least to be detectable to amateur telescopes. 19 rupees. Thank you. Um, have I found any good websites to track the progress and deployments? Yeah, the official website's great. Um, JWST.nasa.gov, I think it is. I could be wrong, but uh, the official NASA website for JWST is uh, fantastic and gives a good timeline as well. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Thank you, Merkster. Yeah, I'll just throw it up there on GitHub and just let people play with it or make comments on it or, or do pull requests or forks on it or whatever they want to do. Have fun. Go to town on it. How am I able to get access to this sort of equipment? Well, this is a telescope I've had for quite a while now. This is my uh, Elk Tundra Classic. Uh, gosh, I've had this scope since uh, 2004. Uh, and the camera, more recent edition, but still, it's an old camera that I bought off eBay years ago. Um, and it's, it's also sort of technology from the late 90s, early 2000s. Will the telescope be close enough to be serviced? That was a question I was waiting to see. Not really. Uh, it's going to be at Lagrange Point 2, far past the moon's orbit. It's not really going to be user serviceable equipment. Um, could you throw a capsule out there with SLS or maybe even a Falcon Heavy with some sort of, uh, you know, uh, souped up second stage or something I don't know maybe but the thing about Hubble servicing Hubble was serviced by a space shuttle which had the great benefit of the cargo the payload bay and that really facilitated that kind of thing um, you know Crew Dragon doesn't have an airlock for the crew you got to depressurize the whole thing if you want to open that up and it's just not designed for doing that kind of work Similar for Orion, it's a capsule. It doesn't have a payload bay. It's not really the kind of uh, workhorse for that kind of job that the shuttle was. And, of course, the shuttle was not designed to go that far from Earth. So there's a lot of reasons why it's not designed for user serviceability, and it's not really going to ever be... It's not, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't think it's likely to ever be user serviced or astronaut serviced. Um... It's just not designed for it, and we don't really have the right spacecraft to do that kind of job out at that distance. Is the camera internally M MIPI, MIPI, or the old standard? Ooh, that's a great question, and I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, don't know what that means. Not familiar with that. Two big questions, which I'm excited to know, from Paw of Kitten. How did the universe look like in the beginning? And that's what this telescope is going to start to get at. And what was built first, the massive black holes or the galaxies? Great questions. 
Starship would work better. That's a good point. That's a good point. Starship would have the kind of internal volume, and you open up, you know, they talk, or they show sort of the the alligator-looking uh, cargo version that opens up on the front end, and, and you could deploy large payloads from that. Maybe you could also use that for servicing if you somehow combine that with a crew version. That starts to look possible, at least in theory, right? But here's the other problem. James Webb Space Telescope was designed long before that was on the drawing board, and so it was not designed to be serviced by astronauts. Hubble was designed from the outset to be serviced by astronauts. It had that going for it from the beginning. Um, that was very much in the plans. So without that kind of functionality built in where you have user serviceable bays and instruments that are designed to be removed and replaced, it's a real problem. You look at the servicing they did recently on AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer on ISS, again, not designed to be serviced by astronauts. They found a way around it, but man, that took a lot of work, and that was comparatively simple compared to the concept of going out to JWST and servicing that and, you know, replacing entire instruments. So that's really a challenge. $5 from David Miller. What is the large reddish star lower left of the frame? Uh, I assume you mean in the real-time frames. I assume you mean the real-time frames. Uh, I can look that up for you. Hopefully my phone's not dead yet. 5% power, we can make it happen. So, uh, if I'm looking at this right, which I think I am, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah, that's it. That is HD34764. And for reference, that star is magnitude 7.34, basically right at the limit of what the human eye can see with averted vision, naked eye, under pristine dark skies. That is the dimmest possible, one of the dimmest possible stars you could theoretically see with averted vision under pristine skies. And you can see how bright it looks to the telescope. According to Sky Safari Pro, it's uh, 180 parsecs, or about 590 light years away. Other designations of this uh, star include um, SAO number 131987 and uh, Tico Tyco number 4752-0116-1. So, there you go. Yeah. Bright to the telescope, but extraordinarily dim to our eyes. And everything else you're seeing in that frame, invisible. Absolutely invisible to the naked eye. Yeah, you can definitely see that star with Binox, but it gives an idea of just how dim JWST is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the fact that it's, you know, kind of right there at the limit of human vision is an excellent uh, yardstick. So what is JST, JWST doing right now? It's going to be slowly deploying uh, pieces of itself, the sun shield the mirrors, it's going to be doing that over the next month as it makes its way to the parking orbit uh, and it's going to spend the next six months commissioning, slowly lowering the temperature down to almost absolute zero uh, as it uh, gets ready to do observations. Ah, Andrew Kroll says, because I have the ability to make intelligent cameras, I will email you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Are there external cameras on JWST? Uh, I don't think so. I could be surprised. I could be wrong, but I don't know of any that are, you know, I'm, I guess you're thinking something like uh, the Starman, Tesla, um, 
where it had cameras mounted looking at itself from, you know, some number of feet away where it was getting sort of a, a selfie shot. It's not really, I don't think it's really set up for that. What app did I use to find that? So for the, uh, for the star name there, I, I looked that up on Sky Safari Pro. Hi, Emily. How different will the Pillars of Life look with the JWST? Probably very different. If you look at um, the Horsehead Nebula, there's a picture of the Horsehead taken in near-infrared by Hubble. And if you look at that and compare it to any visible light picture of the Horsehead, not just the color, but the detail and the the amount of dust that you see is very different in near infrared than in visible light there and so that I think gives you a decent idea of just how different things will look in a different part of the spectrum why did they choose France for launch so the European Space Agency essentially provided that launch in exchange for a certain percentage of time on the telescope. I think they're getting 15 percent? 10 or 15 percent? Something like that. Uh, and their payment was the launch. And if you look at the math on how much this telescope ended up costing, that was a damn good investment because uh, I think you'll find that the price tag of the telescope, if you factor in the percentage of time that they're getting, far out that, that that value for money far outweighs the cost of that rocket. Ah, Kaiser Cube wonders how soon the trajectory or orbit of JWST will be available in Stellarium. Uh, probably pretty quickly, although I guess the question there is, does Stellarium account for the gravity of uh, multiple bodies on a, on an object, so it's got to account for the gravity of at least the the sun and Earth, and realistically the moon, on how that perturbs the orbit, which a lot of those programs aren't necessarily set up to do for user added objects. Um, they could do a custom solution for that maybe or something, but uh, normally I would propagate that with a more complex package like uh, rebound for. Um, for Python. It was the only rocket that could launch it, Howard. I hadn't considered that. Yeah, I mean, it did need an awfully big uh, space in the payload bearing, even folded up. But in addition, it was also, uh, uh, I guess, uh, advantageous from the perspective of it gave an opportunity for Europe to um, put in commitment on it without having to actually just pay up in cash. I mean, they, they could have contributed in, you know, in terms of other methods to more instruments, things like that, but um, certainly the launch was uh, a big part of it. Ah, if Hubble and Webb look at the same thing, will they see it at the same time, or will Webb see something younger? Well, if they're looking at the same object, right, the distance to the object is not going to be significantly different for Hubble than it is for James Webb. James Webb's a million miles out more from the sun than Earth, but, you know, it's uh, that's negligible compared to the light years that it's looking back but it could peer through more dust than Hubble and see things that might otherwise be obscured to Hubble in addition to being able to look at objects that are far more redshifted and therefore see objects that Hubble can't see because it's redshifted clear out of Hubble's uh, uh, range of sensitivity on the spectrum.
right, let me, I'm going to check the current images from the new run and just make sure everything's going smooth. I haven't even been paying attention to the current images so much in the last few minutes, so I'm, I'm just going to dump those into Deep Sky Stacker and take a quick look at them, make sure it all looks good. Got 24 images, 24 minutes of light from the current run. Looks good, looks good. And for the record, I think this will be the last run I do, however long it takes for uh, James Webb to pass through the field of view here. That'll do it for me for tonight, but uh, we still got a ways to go on that. But so far, this run's looking pretty good, and I'm pretty happy with it. Guide stars looking decent. I think we're doing good. What mount are you? Am I using? Uh, I, <laughs> I am using a Mead Alex 200 Classic on the original fork mount with an equatorial wedge. It's polar aligned with the wedge, but uh, it's just a Mead standard wedge. Nothing fancy at all. Uh, the Skywatcher EQ-R uh, is definitely a popular mount. Uh, Paul of Kitten, how will they park the telescope at the L2 point? Is there a special maneuver or will they only break and reduce speed till it is in orbit? So there are some course correction maneuvers along the way, and I think a final burn when they get there, but, um, you know, most of the work's already been done, uh, sending it out there by the, uh, the Ariane 5. So, <laughs> JWST will see all Star Wars prequels. <laughs> a long time ago in many galaxies far, far away. Is the speed of the telescope up to L2 point controllable? Well, like I said, most of the work's already been done by the Ariane uh, 5 second stage. Um, the upper stage of that rocket's done its job, and now it's just coasting. I mean, there's little corrections here and there, but uh, they don't have the ability to dramatically change the, the velocity of uh, the telescope. Fortunately, it's, it's on track. It's right where it should be, according basically according to my tracking uh, it seems to be matching pretty well with the prediction of the trajectory so that tells me things are right on course but if they had to make a, a dramatic change to the velocity they, they really couldn't I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the delta V budget is of the telescope um, we had a we had a guy in here who was on the near cam team he might know but I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's not much, though. It's not like they can uh, do a whole lot of uh, makeup work if the rocket hadn't worked right. But it did. It did its job. So it's right where it should be, as far as I can tell. Is the sun shield going to get holes popped in it by micrometeors? Probably. I mean... If you want to see an example of this, if you go to the Atlantis exhibit at Kennedy Space Center uh, and you see the Space Shuttle Atlantis on display, look at the radiators, the shiny, silvery-looking, uh, steel-looking radiators along the inside of the payload bay, and look for circular patches. You'll see them all over these panels. 
those patches each represent where a micro a bit of uh, micro meteorite orbital debris struck a panel and punctured a tiny hole in it. In some cases, you can even see the divot of the hole underneath the patch. Some of the patches look a bit like Kevlar weaving. Others have silvering over them, and that tells you the age of the patches. In some cases, the radiators have been resurfaced with new silvery material on the outside of them and covered over old patches. Other patches are newer, and you'll see quite a number of these patches, and that's basically telling you in the lifespan of Atlantis, how many times in that level of surface area it was hit. Now, the environment in low Earth orbit is more vicious for that kind of thing than the L2 point probably, but there will still be some flux of damage that probably occurs over time. However, it's not you know, hopefully not going to be enough to be significant to affect the instrument. Another great example of this that you can see or at least you could have a few years ago I don't know if it's still on display or not they had the uh, WIFPIC-2 I think, the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 from Hubble Space Telescope that was retrieved off the telescope on display at Smithsonian and they cored out where they found damage along the outer layer of this thing and you could see it looked like Swiss cheese because they had cored out every spot that they found where they really wanted to study where these impacts had happened and yeah, there's a lot of them, because uh, it was up there, you know, on its own a lot longer than the shuttle was. The shuttle, you know, would spend a couple weeks up at a time at most, but Hubble was just up there constantly. And yeah, it took some serious flux of MMOD damage. Uh, so yeah, James Webb will be exposed to that. But again, since it's not going to be in any kind of low Earth orbit... Um, there's a lot less uh, material up there to worry about. And yeah, uh, Kaiser Q points out the sun shield has been reinforced with composite material to prevent tearing due to micrometeors. JWST engineers saw ahead of this. Uh, yeah, great point. Wouldn't the asteroids in the L2 hit the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, they, they've got a pretty good uh, idea on, on that, I think. Uh, no, there's no... I don't know of any asteroids at the L2 point. There's Trojans at other Lagrange points. I don't know of any at L2. So, no, that should be fine. Is it true the telescope is made of solid gold? No, I don't think so. It's coated. The mirror is coated in gold. Uh, my understanding, I think it's a beryllium composite or something, uh, but it's it's coated with gold for the mirror. The red dot to the left bottom corner is the indicator of the live stream. Okay, I, I guess you're talking about the YouTube, uh, on YouTube itself, yeah. Speaking of indicators, I need to update my indicator position for JWST. It's now here. And the live images on the right. Oh, something else moved in the shot? Yeah, we've been getting... Um, we've been getting satellite transits quite often. I might have missed it. I probably missed it. Um, there are also a couple of residual red pixels from hot pixels. Uh, new hot pixels will form over time on the camera. and If they weren't in the calibration dark frame, uh, they can pop up out of nowhere. Occasionally, you'll also get a pixel or two that uh, is only in a single frame. Sometimes it'll even make a little pattern in the image of a cosmic ray strike, a bit of radiation striking the detector and inducing a charge for a single frame.
are those shooting stars? Oh, you mean in the bottom, uh, yeah, in the bottom left where you think you see shooting stars, those are actually going to be um, satellites. Uh, some of them are geosynchronous. In fact, they're all going to be roughly geosynchronous. Uh, it's currently near the Clark Belt of geostationary satellites, and there are some defunct satellites in graveyard orbits higher than that, or geosynchronous satellites that are not geostationary, they're not at zero degrees inclination, so they'll wander a bit north or south of the geostationary belt, and uh, we're picking up some of those uh, passing by JWST. Of course, they're much closer to us at this point than JWST, which is about half the distance to the moon at this point. Yeah, so they got the the woven meshed uh, panels to stop the tears from micrometeorites. Yeah, I mean, even if they stop tearing, though, it'll probably, you know, poke tiny microscopic holes uh, where they strike. But the idea is to prevent the whole thing from ripping apart, right? They can live with some amount of damage, I'm sure. The idea is to limit the damage so it's not catastrophic. Coming up on 200,000 kilometers, is it? Okay, cool. I haven't checked uh, JPL lately. I should should do that. See what it says. I'm pulling it directly from the Horizons web interface. And also, I should mention, I uh, keep forgetting to mention this, uh, the numbers I'm pulling are direct line distance between my telescope and JWST, not center of Earth to JWST, which is going to be a slightly different number. So we are now 6.23 Universal Time. Do, do, do. So according to this, we're at 175,000 kilometers, but that's uh, that should be direct line distance between me and JWST. Yeah, it's between observer and the target, and I am the observer in this case. And also, that's from uh, Horizons, which which seems to be giving slightly different answers than uh, the official James Webb Space Telescope website. I'm not sure which one's more accurate, but yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. Nice stellar occultation by the telescope there. <laughs> when it actually work starts. So it will start working in about six months uh, after commissioning. Hopefully. All goes well. All's got to go well in deployment, though. And that's a long, complicated deployment process. Do I think SkySafari will add JWST? Maybe, but, you know, any of these apps or programs that want to add JWST have to account for the gravity of the moon, the sun, the earth, all acting on it, and if they want to be really accurate, they need to also make sure they account for um, future correction maneuvers and stuff. I mean, it's not a trivial problem to solve, really, because if, say, you run SkySafari Pro and you want to accelerate into the future, well, if you, you, you can either be approximate and just say, well, it's going to circle around this point, kind of, and just ignore physics a bit and course corrections and be very approximate with it, which is not helpful. Or, to be really precise, you need to account for future correction maneuvers. I mean, it's, it's a tricky problem, really, uh, because it will 
do a little bit of active station keeping to maintain its orbit around L2. I suppose you could strike some sort of compromise position where you where you basically treat it as if it didn't need to do correction maneuvers and and only account for the minimum number of bodies orbit or about bodies gravities on it so that it seems to be more stable than it really is. Um, I wonder about that as a solution. No. Anyway, you kind of got me thinking along the lines of, as a developer, what would I do? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's possible. It would be smart to include it, I'd say, because it will be a viable target for amateur astronomers uh, for years to come. So, as long as that sun shield deploys properly, it should have a nice, bright, reflective surface area. Paul of Kitten asks, would you be happy if you will discover a new comet accidentally when you're watching the sky with us, and how will you name the comet? So, I actually did discover a comet back in 2016, and it was recovered earlier this year, and as such, it has now received a permanent number de designation. When I discovered it in 2016, it was given the systematic name P2016J3 Stereo, because I discovered it using images from the Stereo Ahead spacecraft. It was a serendipitous discovery that I made while processing raw data from uh, Stereo's heli heliospheric imager. Um, and then it was recovered using ground observations this year. So when I found it in 2016, Stereo ahead was on the opposite side of the sun from Earth. So I found it before the comet was even visible from Earth-based telescopes uh, on that orbit. And then it was found uh, in orbit later about four years later, or five years, five years later, earlier this year, um, using uh, ground-based telescopes, and they realized it's the same comet. It's my comet come back around again. And so, because it's been observed on more than one apparition, more than one orbit, and the orbit is now much better uh, established, it has received permanent uh, a permanent number designation. Um, so, it's now a permanently numbered periodic comet, which is, is quite, I don't know, to me it's quite an achievement. Uh, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect it would be seen again necessarily from the ground uh, any time in my lifetime. I mean, it, it's just, uh, I thought it's quite possible maybe it even disintegrated, but it, it didn't. It actually uh, survived. It did, it did actually survive uh, perihelion. Uh, back in 2016, and now it's been seen again. So, now, this year, it received, initially received, uh, again, a systematic designation, uh, P20, was it, uh, P forward slash 2021A3 stereo. Um, so, that was, that was pretty cool to, to find that out. Um, but, as a result of all of that, as I said, it received a permanent number designation, so it's now known as 414P. Uh, that's its uh, permanent number. So, let me see. I'll pull up a website about it. From Aerith.net. And so this is ha this is has some uh, pictures of it. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's some pictures of 414P taken earlier this year from telescopes on the ground. So there's my comet 414P. You don't get to name it yourself. Uh, that's it's named based on a series of rules, either a systematic name like P2016J3 Stereo, which tells you what year it was found what half month it was found in the sequence in which that half month it was found and then if it gets a permanent number it's a sequential number uh, of uh, periodic comets if it's a, assuming it's a periodic comet uh, which in this case it was 
as opposed to a long period comet like uh, Hale Bob, for example. Um, so this was a periodic comet, more like Halley's Comet. And so that's the first periodic comet ever realized to be a periodic comet. Uh, mine is the 414th periodic comet discovered by humans, which is just mind-boggling to me that, that you know there's only 413 others that were numbered before that one um, in the periodic comets. It's it's pretty cool. On the grand scheme of things, it's probably one of the biggest things I'll ever discover in astronomy. And yet, you know, it's just a minor periodic comet that no one's ever heard of. But to me, it'll always be special. So, there you go. Besides the JPL Horizon site, where else can I get coordinates of JWST if I want to observe it? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know, actually. That would be my go-to, honestly, is JPL Horizons, Curtis. Um, they tend to be the most reliable and the most accurate. Anyone else, I would trust less, necessarily. Uh, just because I have experience using JPL Horizons, and it's it's tends to be um, it tends to be the gold standard of things when it comes to ephemeris. So I would strongly recommend using JPL Horizons if at all possible. You can, you know, you can pull the orbital elements and, and calculate it yourself as well from JPL Horizons, but then, you know, you got to be careful to include the gravity of these other bodies and not just treat it as a two-body problem because that will not accurately reflect the orbit. Gold-plated beryllium. Yeah, that, that was my recollection, was gold-plated beryllium for the mirror. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh my gosh, guys. I just realized. Thank you guys for everyone watching who's subscribed tonight. I really appreciate it. I just noticed my subscriber count jumped up by about close to 4,000 tonight. Um, that's huge for me. So thank you all for uh, coming and checking this out and subscribing for more. What would be the average apparent magnitude of JWST? Well, when it gets on station at L2, uh, I did some math on it. Um, assuming the sun shield is kind of uh, face on to Earth uh, and 
has a reflectivity close to 100%, which, I mean, it's darn shiny, so I just guesstimated uh, 99%. Um, I came up with an apparent magnitude of 15, uh, roughly. Rough 15 and change. So, definitely within the reach of amateur equipment, if that's true. But, you know, sun angle is going to matter. You know, if it's angled a bit, maybe it, it reflects the sun away from Earth uh, and isn't nearly as bright. It, it's going to depend on the apparent attitude of the telescope. Ooh! 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 You see that, guys? That is one heck. Oh, gosh. Did I... What happened to it? Uh, somehow I dragged my text off the text box off the screen in my excitement but uh, <laughs> oh gosh but that that is a cosmic ray streak there very clear cosmic ray streak going through the detector the CCD on on my telescope uh, you can see the sequence of the matrix of pixels in the picture the green, the red, the green, the red, and then you get a blue in there, and it's green, and it's red, and it's green, and it's red, and then a blue. That is the the RGB matrix of the of the CCD, where individual pixels um, are getting hit by radiation as it passes through the detector, almost perpendicular, and so it it leaves this nice streak going through there. But it's only hitting a single pixel at a time, and the pixel, each pixel on the detector is assigned a color. It's got a color filter over it, and it's either a red pixel, a green pixel, or a blue pixel. Uh, Two-thirds, or let's see, it's a matrix of, f f repeating matrix of four, two green, one red, one blue, if I remember. So, um, yeah, you're going to see a lot of greens in there, statistically speaking. And, uh, yeah, that's what you see. It's kind of hitting at the right angle where it, it's kind of hitting at almost this perfect um, angle where it's hitting red and green repeatedly and occasionally hitting up a blue. But, uh, yeah, that's a nice example of a cosmic ray streak. And a space telescope, like James Webb Space Telescope, has to deal with a lot more of those than I do. I'm at sea level. The atmosphere is protecting me. Not just our magnetic field, but our atmosphere shields us at ground level from, and especially at sea level, from a lot of that radiation. If you take an airline flight, you're already getting more radiation just because you have less atmosphere shielding you. And then you get on the space station, and even when you're not passing through the South Atlantic Anomaly, you're still dealing with a lot more radiation and a lot more of these cosmic ray hits. So, yeah, wow, that's uh, significant. So, anyway, that was just a one-frame kind of deal there, but, uh, wow, yeah, that was, uh, that was wild. Now, if I could just get my text back, I guess I'll have to make a new one. I dragged it clear off the screen, I think, uh, unless I'm blind, which is also possible. We have 10 pounds from Stevie B. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's a that's what they call it, a cosmic ray strike. It's just radiation from space hitting the detector and causing inducing a charge across a streak of single pixels. How long will I do this? Well, until uh, the telescope reaches the edge of the field of view, um, which... I don't know. I, I could be I could be in for a long haul here tonight, uh, but that's okay. I don't have to work tomorrow, so I'm I'm willing to commit. Now that means I might not be back tomorrow night for for more, but uh, since the weather's clear, it's cool, and uh, things are going well right now, I don't want to rock the boat and disrupt a good thing. 
So we'll keep tracking JWST here f until we uh, get closer to the edge of the field of view uh, later. Plus, additional images mean more astrometric data for independently solving the orbit. Do I work in physics? No. I work in neuroscience, actually. I just do this as a hobby. Uh, the My telescope is, uh, what is it, 12, it's, well, it's a 2 meter focal length 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain, but with the 0.63 focal reducer, I think I'm down to about 1260 millimeters of effective focal length and the images are being recorded with an SBIG ST2000 XCM single shot color CCD camera and an SBIG A07 adaptive optics unit uh, being run by CCD soft oh congratulations bad moms fitness husband worked on the telescope and was a part of the launch. That's great. <laughs> if that telescope if this telescope is watching that one, which one is watching this one? Hmm, maybe an alien telescope, who knows. <laughs> Ah, why will JWST be orbiting the Lagrange instead of parking it spot on in the Lagrange? Because the Lagrange point, too, is not truly a stable point. It won't want to stay there. Any slight deviation or perturbation will cause it to drift away from that point. So it's more stable if it orbits that point instead. It works better that way. Hey Rohan Brid, so you just joined. So what you're seeing on the bottom left is a replay. In fact, I should put text over that too. Uh, the bottom left re uh, looping video is a replay of an hour and 20 minutes of images that we collected earlier in the evening. And that's a time lapse of James Webb. can't type it's too cold okay shrink that down come here this will make it easier and then uh, on the right side behind it we have the live images from the telescope That probably makes more sense now.
and then in, in the top sort of left we have the guide star that the telescope is guiding on at 3 Hertz and that's what's driving the adaptive optics to compensate for atmosphere and uh, any tracking issues to uh, keep the stars nice and tight. Focus looks like it's maintaining right now, which is good. I'm paging back and forth between the start of this run and the end of this run. The only thing that's changed is the overall brightness level of the image because it's, uh, it's on its way to setting. It's getting lower in the sky over time, uh, and that's going to affect it. But looking at the timing of things, we probably have another hour until we hit close to the edge of the field of view. do need to think about pausing for a brief second to increase the exposure length of the auto guider as we get further down into the muck um, the guide star gets dimmer and it starts to have more trouble tracking so I'm gonna pause it briefly to give that a little bump on time okay, give it uh, 0.4 seconds Gets us down to about 2.4 hertz, but uh, I'll take it in exchange for the increased signal to noise ratio, I guess. And another member, Bob Johnson. Thank you very much for joining and, and uh, supporting our work here. Can we see JWST from Mars? Probably not. Uh, that might be a bridge too far. Certainly not with this telescope, but uh, I have to do the math on that. I, I suspect probably not. How about a nice look at Andromeda? Uh, some other night. Not, not tonight. It's getting low as it is, I think, and, uh, well, basically, JWST is the priority for tonight. Is it going to pick up sounds, too? Well, not in a uh, traditional sense, but, you know, they have before interpreted sounds, or I guess you could say uh, determined uh, very, very low sounds based on looking at shock waves within nebulae and um, I've seen that kind of thing before. Or you could take... Well, that's more of a radio telescope thing. But yeah. Uh, not really uh, equipped for detecting sound per se. 
but you know if you see uh, shockwave passing through a medium like a nebula, then I guess you could determine some kind of frequency of it. But it you know tend to be very low frequency stuff there. See, one example frame without the guide star system to see how much of an improvement it makes. Yeah, at the very end, we'll do that. I mean, it's brutal uh, without it. Maybe not as brutal in a one-minute exposure as, like, a five-minute exposure, but still, it's a it's pretty noticeable difference. So, is there any place in our solar system where we can see JWST after its arrival at L2? Well, Earth's the best spot, I think, for that. Uh, we'll be able to see it from here, uh, as long as the sun shield opens up correctly and it's sort of face-on, facing Earth, which it will. Um, yeah, there will be opportunities to see it here from the surface. There should be, anyway, according to my math. Huh. So their mid course correction lasted till 8:50. It was a 65 minute burn. Lasted 65 minutes. So that went till 8:55 p.m. Eastern time, which was just before I started the stream. I still think maybe that initial shift in brightness that I saw in that first frame might have been some residual alteration to attitude after their mid course correction burn. Which is pretty cool if that's the case. I was just reading uh, the Twitter for James Webb Space Telescope. So, uh, yeah, just uh, checking that out. do some stacking on the latest run of images and just see how things are looking. We're up to 63 frames now. Not quite as many as we have in the current time lapse that's playing. But it could be enough to put together a new time lapse and just uh, put that up too. Maybe I'm too eager, but I kind of want to see what it looks like now.
Interesting. Yeah. So it's now curving the other way, uh, which I assume is also still due to uh, topocentric parallax. And now that it's past the meridian and going the other way, it's like bending the apparent trajectory the other way. I think that's what's going on there. That's really cool. So I'm going to do the same processing that I did the f to the first set of images. Which is all automated with my little Python script. Open up the new time lapse. And that, try to find space on here for that. There it is. So this is. Sixty-three frames at a minute apiece. It's actually because of the time it takes to download the images. It's actually a little bit more uh, in time that it covers. So in time that it covers, it's actually seventy-two minutes because of the the space between frames for download. Now I'm going to complete the cover of the live image, aren't I? Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to use my real my screen real estate here a little more intelligently if I can.
That's better. I had to free up a little space on the computer, too. These images aren't huge, but this computer has got a fairly small, solid-state hard drive. Oh, there goes a satellite streak through the live image. And I had a $1 super chat from uh, DTN for $1 Canadian. Thank you very much. And we had a. Ten dollar. Oh wait, that was. Uh, yeah, I read that before. Stephen B. Thanks for your sharing your knowledge. Keep it up. That was a uh, ten pounds. Thank you so much. And if I didn't mention before, I think I might have missed it. Two uh, one ninety nine U.S. dollars from Brian Moon with a red thumbs up. Thank you so much. dollar tip from John Putnam. Thank you so much. Also, just a fun note, according to my live stream dashboard, we've had uh, over 500,000 playbacks of this video, which officially makes this video uh, my most popular video on the entire channel. <laughs> so thanks, guys. I love it. Uh, $3 from John Putnam with a fist bump. Thank you. And $4.99 super chat from Nemo Nova. Thank you for what you're doing. Rockin', thank you, appreciate it. I'm enjoying it right along with you guys, this is great. And a $5 super chat from uh, Lexmark, uh, $5 New Zealand. Keep it up with a running pair. Thank you. Appreciate it.
A uh, question from David Henderson, Astronomy Live. Are the time lapses you are showing images from when the telescope made a burn? Ah, it's a great question. The mid-course correction finished up just before I started, unfortunately. Uh, I tried to get on it er as early as I possibly could tonight. Um, it was just above the tree line, really, from, from where I was looking. Uh, but they had finished the burn about ten minutes before I started the webcast. However, I did notice the very first picture I took... It's oddly brighter. There's like a bright spot on it, like it flared for a moment. And I, I do wonder if they were reorienting the telescope, maybe adjusting the attitude after the burn. And if so, it might have uh, changed the sun angle and caused a glint from the sun briefly, which I might have caught. But that's, that's a very speculative uh, assumption on my part. But it did seem that something was happening there just about 10 minutes after the burn or so. And uh, 40, gosh, I'm forgetting, is it rupees? Uh, from, uh, oh boy, I'm gonna butcher that name. Uh, I'm just gonna stick with the last name, Saxena. Uh, what if something goes wrong with the telescope while the telescope opens? Well, unfortunately, there's not much we can do heading out to uh, Lagrange Point 2. It's on its own. It has to work. It is uh, pretty tough if it doesn't. People earlier in the chat were speculating maybe Starship could make it out there and do something, but that's still, you know, in development, and... Uh, it would be pretty tough to get it ready for doing a servicing mission out there on, uh, you know, any time in the next year or two. So that would be a real tough situation. It's pretty much got to work. It's not like Hubble where we get a free do-over with astronaut servicing at the ready. And it wasn't designed to be serviced by astronauts either. That's the other real tough part of it. Hubble from the outset was designed to be serviced by astronauts. Oh, and by the way, as far as the uh, the time lapses go that I'm showing as in relation to the burn, these were later than the burn. Um, I didn't run a time lapse of the very first images that I grabbed because it was a fairly short run, but I'll I'll pull that in later. Uh, I don't think you know, I don't think either of these time lapses are from that first run of images, so I'll have to I'll have to run that later. Anyway, I need to go get my phone charger, because it, if it's not dead yet, it very nearly is, and uh, it's it's going to shut off any second now. Uh, it's at 1%, so I'm going to do that and maybe grab a hot cup of cocoa or something, and I'll be back in a minute. Uh, thanks, guys. Hope you guys continue to enjoy this live stream of the James Webb Space Telescope.
All right, so hopefully uh, my little adjustment there has helped quell some of the uh, troll and bot activity. Apologies to the mods who were uh, thrown into the fire tonight, but uh, hopefully we've got that under control. So just a reminder, uh, this will be the last run of images of James Webb Space Telescope for tonight. Uh, after it reaches the edge of field of view and leaves, then I'm going to call it a night myself. But uh, we basically have until that little dashed line reaches the uh, edge of the frame, which isn't too far away at this point. It's just right there. So a little bit more to go. And then we'll have our last time lapse of the night, and I'll throw that into processing real quick. And basically it'll finish up the bottom time lapse on the left hand side. And we'll have a more complete uh, cycle there. So again, I want to thank everyone who has come out tonight and uh, sub to the channel or just enjoying it for tonight. Thank you so much. I'm going to get caught up here on uh, Super Chats. We had a Super Chat from uh, Old Soul Amber for $4.99 US dollars. What is everyone's opinion on the multiverse? Well, <laughs> when it comes to the MCU, I haven't actually seen uh, the new Spider-Man movie yet, so no spoilers. Don't spoil us. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah, in terms of physics, it's an interesting, very interesting theory. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's possible. Oh. <laughs> oh, dear. I mean, it. It's not the end of the world, but I just realized I need to fix the time-lapsing software. I ran an old version, apparently. I thought I fixed this, but apparently I ran an old version that had the uh, BGR bug instead of RGB bug. So, um, the way that OpenCV handles images, if you convert from NumPy arrays, you have to watch out because the layers are sequenced differently than you might expect. OpenCV handles images in BGR format, blue, green, red. Most people think of images as being, uh, normal image formats as being RGB, red, green, blue. It looks at the numbers in the sequence of blue, green, red. And so I've got red and uh, blue flipped in both of these time-lapse videos at the moment. We will fix that. Uh, at the end here. In fact, I'm going to start fixing that in the code right now. That should be the other way around. Apparently, I did not run the latest version. Bad astronomy live. Bad astronomy live. So, I need to make sure I run the correct version that doesn't have that bug and fix that. I just noticed the blue star is the red star and the red star is the blue star in the bottom time lapse. They're flipped the other way in color. Um, that's why they looked weird to me. It wasn't just because they were blown out, it's because the colors flipped. Ugh. Alright, well, it's an easy fix, fortunately. And I've already, I know I've already fixed this before. It's the annoying thing, is I thought I had it, thought I had it fixed, but, uh, that's what I get for not pulling from the correct directory where I store this code. I just grabbed it off of an old directory that I had already run it on, but it was not the most recent version. I didn't check to make sure it was the most recent version. And sure enough, that came back and bit me. So we will fix that. <sighs> okay. see, where is that issue? Should just be able to fix it by going like that. Just reverse the order. Which looks like it would be the right order, which is why I probably had that bug in there in the first place, but it's not actually the right order. Okay. 
<sighs> Technically, this should end up overriding the video. And if I just reload it, it should uh, be corrected. Definitely backwards. So strange. It's just strange that I had an old version sitting around like that, but again, I, I do have some sort of sense of organization to this thing, and I, I do have a central directory where I keep some of these programs, and I didn't go in there and I didn't grab the proper version. No, I... I made the mistake of going into a different directory where I knew I could find it and I just grabbed it off of there because I thought it was recent enough and it wasn't. Oh well. It's a simple fix, like I said. Not the end of the world. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Andrew Kroll. BGR is technically correct order. Blues first. That's fine. It's just backwards from how I normally think of it. I always call it RGB images, but no, it's BGR, at least. OpenCV certainly demands it. Yeah, the bright star has magnitude of magnitude 7, uh, which is basically the limit of what the human eye can see. And that just shows you how much dimmer the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope is than what you can see. So in that in that live image there where you see the, uh, the bright looking star, that star is the limit of human naked eye vision. And to the telescope of course that is uh, that is super bright. So the star in the center of the frame is HD 34764. That Sounds correct, but I need to double check the number. Yeah, 34764. That's correct. Yep. That's the one. Are we going to be able to see it when it's at L2? Yeah, uh, potentially. I, I hope so. It should be, according to my math, but it will depend on the attitude of the telescope, and uh, of course, the sun shield's got to open up properly. But assuming all that's the case and the sun shield is face on to us, then yes, it will, uh, it should be visible to the telescope. <laughs> should specify that. Again, it will be even dimmer than you see it now. By about three magnitudes, at least. What is the name of this bright star left of the sun? Left of the sun. I'm not sure what is meant by left of the sun. Alright, let me see if I can refresh the video. Okay, so that one's corrected now. Now to correct the other one. Should be corrected anyway. Double check it in a minute.
could the Hubble Space Telescope see the James Webb Space Telescope? Oh, definitely could in theory. I think it'd be hilarious if they if they did that, but uh, they generally don't pick Hubble targets based for, based on what will get the laughs or the. Yeah, whatever. But, you know, I think they, they should consider doing that. I mean, it'd be cool. Okay, so that's now corrected the color. As you can see, it's flipped to the color of which one was the yellow star, which one was the blue star. And that's the way it should look. That's the way the images should look. So, that's now been fixed. I was also going to double check and make sure that my telescope hadn't opened up while we've been streaming. I'm going to log back in. Back at the start, I checked to see if I could control a telescope somewhere else in the world, New Mexico or California, and get some simultaneous observations. But no, it's roof closed. That's a shame. Yeah. It's all roof closed, so yeah, there was no hope of simultaneous observations tonight, but we will try to do that later. We will be back on JWST again in the future. And one other thing, because it was suggested earlier that I turn off the auto-guiding altogether, turn off the AO7 and just show you guys what would happen if I weren't using that, what, uh, what the images would look like. The answer is they'd be a streaky mess. but we'll see that in person. In just a bit. And if you stick around to the end, we'll also do the final time-lapse rendering, as I said. Taking all the images from this last run and dumping it in. Let's see, what are we working with right now? So, last I left off dumping in image 227. And what are we up to now? Two seventy six looks like. So we're up to 112 minutes of light, spanning a time period of 2 hours, 8 minutes, roughly, so far.
focus looks like it's been solid for these two hours, too. So that's good. That's really good to see. And we're getting close to the end now. It's not too much further to go before it leaves the image. So the equipment that I'm using tonight is an 8-inch Mead LX200 Classic with an SBIG ST2000XCM single-shot color camera, deep space camera, with an SBIG A07 adaptive optics unit performing auto-guiding. And as for when we can expect to see the first images from James Webb, uh, probably after commissioning in about six months. Yes, and the curve at the top time lapse is different than the curve in the second time lapse, correct? The top time lapse was at the beginning of the webcast, and at that time it was still approaching the zenith, the highest point, or approaching the meridian, I should say, uh, its highest point in the sky, and now it's, it's receding, it's uh, heading down to the west. And so, I believe that shift has altered how... Uh, the top eccentric parallax is altering the apparent trajectory, bending it uh, into a curve, one way as it's rising and the other way as it's setting. And the software I'm using for controlling the camera is in as a CCD soft. The software I'm using to create the time lapses is just a batch processing script I wrote in Python. Uh, James Webb is definitely a lot larger than Hubble and will have more resolution uh, for that reason. Uh, I guess that's true, even at the wavelengths they're at. Anyway, it's late and I'm tired. Uh, so I'm trying to do all this off the top of my head, but basically, yes. Uh, however, it is specialized for infrared observations, whereas Hubble uh, was really specialized for visual, visual wavelength observations and could dip into near-infrared and into UV. But uh, basically, it's gargantuan compared to Hubble. A lot more light collecting area. It's going to be excellent. Hubble's still up there, still working, thankfully. What is that giant yellow star? So, uh, that was the one I read off earlier. Oh no, I've lost it. Uh, somebody had it in the chat earlier. <laughs> who was it who had it in the chat? Can you put it back in? I've lost my position on Sky Safari at this point. And it's 3 a.m. and I'm tired. And I would like very much if I could find it again in the chat. HD34764. Yes, there we go. Can I share the script? Yes, I want to make it public. I just, I want to clean up the rough edges because it's really tailored for my images, my camera settings and everything. Um, I want to make it a little more generally useful for people. 
Yeah, there we, go. there we go. People posting in the chat again. That's the bright star you see in the center of the live images. And it looks like I've officially passed 25,000 subscribers now, uh, thanks to everyone joining tonight. So thank you again, uh, everyone who's come out and watched. I know a lot of you are here from Everyday Astronaut, and I hope you enjoy my content as well. Yeah, FMFM pegged to coalesce the frames. I mean, yeah, it's... I guess technically I kind of am through OpenCV. I don't know exactly how all that works in terms of how they interact with each other, but I mean, it does a decent job. Um, FFmpeg might be a better way of trying to get it into a format that uh, Twitter is happy with for posting it on Twitter, because Twitter doesn't seem to like the encoding that I use in OpenCV at the moment for MP4. Anyway, yeah. Ooh, just ordered your first 8-inch daub. Any tips on what you should start with and things you can see? So, definitely start with uh, practicing star hops. Learning how to hop from star to star. Recognizing star patterns. Um, and you can really do that probably easiest with binoculars to start with. Uh, getting to the Andromeda Galaxy from the Andromeda Constellation is... Uh, a pretty easy starting star hop. Uh, it's one that I learned on. And it took me a few tries going from knowing how to do it in binoculars to knowing how to move the telescope where you're dealing with a much more narrow field of view. Always start with your lowest magnification till you find your, your target and then gradually move, move up if you need to. With the Dobsonian though, you're not going to have tracking. Um, so you're going to want to leave some some wiggle room, some room on the edges of your field of view to allow for drift uh, as the Earth rotates. But Dobsonians are a lot of fun. They are a great starting scope, really easy to operate, and good bang for your buck. Orion's easiest to practice on. Yeah, that's probably true, but I would say it was so easy that because you can see it in viewfinder, I mean, yeah, it's a good one to start with, just to observe. But because you can just straight up see it in the viewfinder real easy, like the crappy viewfinder I had back in the day, I couldn't see Andromeda Galaxy with it. So, it forced me to learn how to star hop in the eyepiece itself to get there. Um, and so I, I really learned the process that way, starting with the Andromeda Galaxy. Why does the orange star look like a donut? My focus seems to be fine. Yeah, the focus really is fine. It's just the way CCD Soft handles the raw fits files and the dynamic range. It does a goofy thing with changing brightness levels over the course of the star, and it, it gives it that donut sort of look. I kind of like it, honestly, as it, just as a live preview aesthetic. Uh, gives it a little bit of 
I don't know, pizzazz? I, I don't know. But I guess that's just because I'm used to it and I, I've come to find its quirks charming. Others are probably just annoyed with it, but... Anyway, when I process the raw fits files for the time-lapse, as you see on the left, it's not there. That's just an artifact of how CCD Soft is handling the files. So here in a couple minutes, when it leaves the field of view, I'll dump in all the images, and we'll process our final time-lapse for the night, uh, the full last run of JWST traveling from the top of the frame out through the left side of the frame in this nice arcing curve uh, past that nice bright star. Uh, Jacob Young asks, am I diffraction limited by the mirror right now or just at the behest of the night scene? It's more at the behest of what's easiest um, maybe seeing is a factor a bit tonight, but really, I, I would do this anyway, just because it's just easiest for keeping the space telescope in there for as long as possible in the field of view, uh, and uh, just makes for a nice crisp image. Yeah, um, don't tend to flirt. I don't tend to flirt with diffraction limits until I start doing stuff like. Uh, using a Barlow and going real high magnification after the space station. If you look back at some of my recent videos, I've done some ISS tracking, and yeah, it, it tends to be seeing limited, but on a rare occasion, even here in Florida, I can get some nights of good seeing and really get down to diffraction limits on ISS. Uh, it's, it's rare, I will admit, but it does happen. Crew 1, probably the Crew 1 video I got of ISS, uh, with the Crew-1 Dragon dock to it is one of the best I've done and really was at diffraction limits. Um, I love that shot uh, that I got of, of uh, Crew-1 docked ISS. So if you check back some of my fairly recent videos on the channel, you'll see that. It was uh, ISS flying right by Jupiter. Uh, that night was fantastic. It was a winter night, kind of like this one, as I recall, or it felt like a winter night anyway. Uh, and uh, the air was just real steady for whatever reason, and I uh, was able to get some really high quality shots at 4 meters fo equivalent focal length with a uh, Blackmagic 4K camera, uh, which I use for filming rocket launches and satellites and the like. Yeah, I do like to use stellar drone background music. Um, so, used with permission from stellar drone. How long will JWST be visible? Well, hopefully for its whole life. Um, once it gets out to L2 and it expands the sun shield, uh, it should still be reflective enough to be visible to amateur equipment. Maybe not as easily in the eyepiece, but uh, certainly with a CCD camera like this. But speaking of visibility, we're reaching the edge of the image here, guys. This is probably the last image or two before uh, we call it a night here. And like I said, before you go, stick around. We'll have the last complete time lapse uh, of the last imaging run. And uh, also, I'll shut down the auto-guiding and just show you what happens when that gets uh, turned off so you can see how effective the AO7 is at improving these images. And a $2 super chat from uh, Ray. Ray, why was Earth message deleted and not Viagra's? I don't know. Sorry. I have not been able to keep up with the level of uh, message deletions that the mods have had to do. It's been a hectic night. Uh, we've had more viewers, live viewers tonight than I think any of my other live streams. So, apologies if your message got deleted by accident or uh, just got mistaken for something offensive, but the mods have been uh, having uh, their work cut out for them tonight trying to, to manage the crowd. So... Please be patient and uh, 
bear with us as we adjust to our growing community. But I, again, want to thank you all for being here and joining tonight. It's been a real pleasure to be able to bring this to you. And, uh, and show you the James Webb Space Telescope. Ahmed asks, Astronomy Live, does JWST have onboard cameras pointed at the spacecraft? Uh, yeah, I got this question earlier. I think it's, uh, I think it's in relation to probably something like Tesla and the, uh, Starman and the Roadster with cameras pointed at Starman. I don't think they really have anything configured like that for JWST as far as I know. I could be wrong, but I don't know of anything like that on, on the spacecraft. Um, I mean, it would be cool for outreach purposes and everything, but you got to imagine, this thing's already massively complex, and they want—they don't want to add anything extraneous that doesn't need to be there, um, serving the mission, you know, serving the purposes of the mission. Okay, now <clears throat> we're on what will almost definitely be the last image of JWST that you see there. So, by this next frame, it will have left the frame, I expect. And uh, that will be it for new images of JWST tonight. So thank you again, and stay tuned here. And for a minute, uh, we'll have uh, we'll have the final time lapse up here briefly. Yep, just maybe a hint of a tail of it as it's uh, leaving the frame there. It's hard to tell if that's noise or if that's actually it. Um, but in any case, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna load up these images. So we have all of the frames, 277 through 292 now included. So we have 128 frames of the James Webb Space Telescope from this run, spanning a period of 2 hours, 26 minutes. That's how long it took to cross from where the telescope put it at the end of the slough down to the end of the field of view, the edge of the field of view. Pretty cool stuff. So, now I'm going to stack those images. And, okay, so for now, I'm going to go ahead and turn off auto guiding, abort the image, and we're going to run an image with no auto guiding. So, this is what happens when you turn off the AO7. This next image will be an example of that. just so you guys can see how effective the AO7 really is. So the AO7 is now off, it's not doing anything, and the camera's just running, the telescope's tracking, unguided. And this 8-inch LX200 on its original fork mount with a wed uh, standard mead wedge, it's not really equipped for this level of deep space imaging. It's really the AO7 and the SBIG features that are enabling these images to look as good as they do by uh, performing adaptive optics and compensating for deficiencies in the gears, as well as atmospheric turbulence, uh, really, really steps up the image quality. So watch the stars here as this new image comes in. Notice how much blobbier and smeared they get. Yeah, see that? They're immediately elongated, especially along the horizontal axis. Uh, that's the right ascension axis where the telescope is turning to track with the motion of the Earth. But it sometimes moves a little too fast and sometimes moves a little bit too slow because the gears are not perfect. And that leads to elongation of the stars. We call that periodic error. Uh, and this is with periodic error correction running. The telescope has a built-in feature to try to compensate for that by playing back a recording of the periodic error corrections 
over the course of one full rotation of the gears. But that is not a silver bullet solution. It does not completely eliminate it. It just minimizes the jerkiness of it, kind of, and, and reduces it somewhat, but not all the way. So that gives you an idea of uh, the difference between unguided versus guided exposures and uh, what the AO7 is doing to enable much better images. So, uh, let's see, I've stacked those. Let me just check the final stack, see what that looks like. Oh yeah, that looks nice. Yeah, in the final stacked image, uh, which... Do I have a way of... I guess I don't have a way of easily saving on this. Save as... Can I save that as a JPEG or something? No, I can't. Oh, maybe. Can I save this as a JPEG, please? No, you won't let me save as an 8-bit. Eh, that would have been nice, but whatever. So, yeah. I don't know how well this will come across in the time lapse, but not only can I see that it's curving due to, uh, presumably due to topocentric parallax and uh, uh, the rotation of the Earth, but also it's dimming. I can tell it's getting dimmer as it's getting further away. That's really interesting to me. I can really see that. Now, part of that is going to be atmospheric attenuation uh, as well. I guess I should account for that, but... Uh, Part of that is it's it's getting further away, so it's getting dimmer. And I can see that in the final stacked picture. You guys can't see that at the moment, but uh, let's see how this looks in the time lapse. So let me go ahead and grab all of these. Okay, it's rendering the time-lapse now. So, let me add in the new time lapse. There we go. That looks good.
So again, this is a time lapse spanning from uh, 5.42.52 seconds universal time to 8.08 and 13 seconds universal time. Or about uh, 2 hours 26 minutes. If my math is right. Yeah, about 25 minutes and some seconds. Yeah. 2 hours, 25 minutes and change. When should there be more streams of stuff like this? Well, when I have time and the weather cooperates. It's got to be that magical combination of factors. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, perhaps as soon as is later this week or next weekend, depending on how things go with uh, time. We'll just have to see. It's curved because of Earth's rotation. Yeah, from uh, parallax from Earth's rotation, uh, deflecting the apparent path of uh, the telescope the James Webb Space Telescope, to be exact. So, a couple super chats I missed. I can't quite see this whole one here. Let me see if I can scroll up and see it in the stream. Sorry, I was busy processing when they came in. Uh, da, da, da. Five pounds from Electron 1024. If telescope can't see visible light spectrum, is there any method to see real galaxy colors? Uh, I mean, I don't know how much interpolation could help with that, but... You know, it could see... I don't know. It, it can't see natural visible light colors the way we see it, right? I mean, it just can't. Uh, it can see into near-infrared and even maybe into... I forget I forget what the upper limit is on uh, the spectrum of, of James Webb, but it's not going to present things in the colors that we normally see. However... If you code it, you know, if you recode the colors and such, I mean, you're going to have to anyway because it's, it's going to see primarily infrared. Um, but, you know, if you assign the shortest wavelengths to bluish color, blue colors and the longest wavelengths to red colors, if you're looking in near infrared, like you can process near infrared images of Hubble, for example, especially with redshift galaxies, it looks surprisingly natural. You wouldn't necessarily know. Um, but, of course, the real work that Webb is going to do is going to be in very distant, highly redshifted galaxies that them themselves have different morphologies than what we're accustomed to seeing in the current universe. So, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty wild <laughs> to see. Mitch Belomdo for two dollars, or th sorry, two, uh, uh, two euros. Thank you for your awesome stream. Best regards from... Not sure. Hmm. Is that... I don't know what that... Uh... Slovakia. Slovakia. Sorry, I should have known what that was. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you could join us tonight. And Frank Frank, New Zealand for five... Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Got a new impressed subscriber t t tonight. Cheers from New Zealand. Appreciate it. Thanks. Glad to have you aboard. Upper limit is pretty much green. Thanks, Kaiser Cube. I wanted to say orange, but yeah, green. Interesting. Okay. I was just going off the top of my head. So, yeah, it can see into green then. So, yeah, according to Kaiser Cube, I sounds right. It sounds plausible. Um, yeah, you know, if you code that to be 
the blue end of the spectrum on the image versus red being somewhere down into the infrared. You'd be surprised a lot of times, especially with some of these red shifted galaxies, they look surprisingly natural colors. Um, so, yeah, thank goodness for false color. But the funny thing is when the false color corresponds to bluer versus redder wavelengths, sometimes it can look uh, quite natural. Other times, though, we're going to see things that are, you know, unlike what we typically see. Technically, a lot of Hubble images are that way. False color images of uh, narrowband, from narrowband filters. And amateurs use those too, especially nowadays. A lot of amateurs deliberately try to mimic the, col the Hubble color palette. And it, it produces some beautiful pictures of uh, emission nebula especially. So... Yeah, I think I think we had a very successful night tonight. On the whole, we captured James Webb Space Telescope, and here we see it, you know, traveling away from Earth and uh, heading out to L2. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty darn cool. Yeah, I think a lot of the brightness dimming. I'm looking at the time lapse now. I'm noticing the brighter stars too. You can really see with the brightest stars how they shrink as well, and that's that's definitely atmospheric attenuation. As it gets lower in altitude over the horizon, uh, you get more atmospheric attenuation. So overall, the image is becoming dimmer, and that's affecting James Webb Space Telescope as well. So I don't know how much the magnitude's actually dimming there versus how much of that is driven by atmosphere. It's interesting to watch, nevertheless. It's, it's very interesting to see. And I do like, I have to say, I really do like how it splits through that uh, pair of blue and, and orangish, yellowish stars there, that nice color duet. Uh, it looks good. So I'll have uh, you know a more finalized, cleaned up uh, processed version of these time lapses uploaded to the channel later. I intend to run this through some denoising algorithms and uh, also maybe tweak up the uh, time lapse software itself to grab a wider portion of the histogram to work with so the stars don't look so blown out. Um, and we'll see how that ends up looking. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's great. I think this is a, some good stuff to work with here. So, I'm going to finish up by collecting some flat field calibration frames offline. That will clean up some dust motes that you see, some little dark donuts in the image. If you, if you know where to look, you can see them. Uh, and that will calibrate for that. But uh, let me see, any, any last minute questions here in the chat for this evening? I'll make sure I get any super chats that might have come in last minute. Make sure we're up to date with everyone. Okay, good. Uh, is the proper motion increasing, says Kaiser Cube. Yeah, you notice that. I notice that too, that it seems like it actually accelerates in the time lapse. I have a theory about that. Um, I need to see if that's true, but I have a theory that because of the decreasing altitude and angle of the uh, telescope as it gets lower in the sky. At first, the the Earth's rotation is causing that path to bend and deflect, but at some point it starts essentially contributing to or adding on to the angular velocity of James Webb itself, causing the apparent angular velocity to seem to increase, but it's really Earth's rotation now becoming more aligned from my location with the direction that the space telescope is actually traveling in the sky on its own. And so that appears to accelerate it. I, I think that's what's happening there. It's going to be interesting to see how uh, Fine Dorb handles the astrometry on that, if it figures out the correct solution on that. Uh, what constellation is it now? I believe it, well, when we were looking, it was still near Orion. 
uh, and that would still be the case. It would still be an Orion. The coordinates you'll have to get for your own location, because your location very much matters. Your coordinates are going to be different than my coordinates because of your position on Earth. So go to JPL Horizons. If you Google that, you can get to the JPL Horizons web uh, web interface, and you can plug in your location and the time and get the exact coordinates of James Webb for your location. That's what I was doing all throughout tonight. So thank you guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining. Uh, we had a lot of new viewers tonight, and uh, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy. Uh, we'll come back for more later, and we'll track James Webb later as well. Till next time, clear skies, folks.